gave no indication of disillusionment. Until she got inside. Then she said something about a frat house. I glanced around. She wasn't far off. Union Jack in the corner. The one I'd waved at the North Pole. Old rifle on the TV stand. A gift from Omen, after an official visit. Xbox console. Just a place to keep my stuff, I explained, moving around some papers and clothes. I'm not here much. It was also constructed for smaller people, humans of a bigone era. Thus the rooms were tiny and the ceilings were doll's house low. I gave her a quick tour, which took thirty seconds. Mind your head. I'd never noticed until then just how shabby the furniture was. Brown sofa, Broner beanbag chair. Meg paused before the beanbag. I know, I know, our dinner guests were my cousin Huge, a boyfriend Jack, and my mate Charlie. The salmon turned out perfectly and everyone complimented Meg on her culinary talents. They also devoured her stories. They wanted to hear all about suits and her travels. I was grateful for their interest, their warmth. The wine was as good as the company, and there was plenty of it, and after dinner we moved into the snug, put on music and silly hats, and danced. I have a fuzzy memory, and a grainy video on my phone, of Charlie and me rolling on the floor while Meg sat nearby laughing. Then we got into the tequila. I remember huge hugging Meg, as if they were sisters. I remember Charlie giving me a thumbs up. I remember thinking, if meeting the rest of my family goes like this, we're home free. But then I noticed that Meg was feeling poorly. She complained of an upset stomach and looked terribly pale. I thought, oh, lightweight. She took herself off to bed. After a nightcap, I saw our guests out and tidied up a bit. I got into bed around midnight and crashed out, but I woke at 2 a.m. to hear her in the bathroom, being sick, truly sick, not the drunken sick I'd imagined. Something else was going on. Food poisoning. She revealed that she'd had squid for lunch at a restaurant. British calamari. Mystery solved. From the floor she said softly, Please tell me you're not having to hold back my hair while I'm vomiting. Yes. I am. I rubbed her back and eventually put her to bed. Weak, near tears, she said she'd imagined a very different end to date for. Stop, I said. Taking care of each other? That's the point. That's love, I thought, though I managed to keep the words inside. Just before Meg returned to Canada, we went to Frogmore Gardens for a walk. It was on the way to the airport. A favorite spot of mine, I said. It spoke to her as well. She especially loved the swans, and especially one that was very grumpy. We named him Steve. Most swans are grumpy, I said. Majestic, but saw purses. I always wondered why, since every British swan was the property of Her Majesty, and any abuse of them, thereby was a criminal offence. We chatted about Euge and Jack, whom she loved. We talked about Meg's work. We talked about mine. But mostly we talked about this relationship, a subject so immense it seemed inexhaustible. We continued the talk as we got back into the car and drove to the airport, and kept talking in the car park, where I dropped her on the sly. We agreed that if we were serious about giving ourselves a chance, a real chance, we'd need a serious plan. Which meant, among other things, making a vow never to let more than two weeks pass without seeing each other. We'd both had long-distance relationships, and they'd always been hard, and part of the reason had always been lack of serious planning. Effort. You had to fight the distance, defeat that distance. Meaning, travel. Lots and lots of travel. Alas, my movements attracted more attention, more press. Governments had to be alerted when I crossed international borders. Local police had to be notified. All my bodyguards had to be shuffled. The burden, therefore, would fall on Meg. In the early days, it would have to be her spending time on planes, her crisscrossing the ocean, while still working full-time on suits. 
Many days the car came for her at 4.15 am to take her to set. It wasn't fair for her to shoulder the burden, but she was willing, she said. No choice, she said. The alternative was not seeing me, and that, she said, wasn't feasible. Or bearable. For the hundredth time since July 1, my heart cracked open. Then we said goodbye again. See you in two weeks. Two weeks. God. Yes. Soon after that day, Willie and Kate invited me over to dinner. They knew something was going on with me, and they wanted to find out what it was. I wasn't sure I was ready to tell them. I wasn't sure I wanted anyone else to know just yet. But then, as we sat around their TV room, both kids tucked into bed, the moment felt right. I casually mentioned that there was a new woman in my life. They surged forward. Who is she? I'll tell you, but please, 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 I need you both to keep it a secret. Yes, Harold, yes, yes, who is it? She's an actress. Oh? She's American. Oh. On a show called Suits. Their mouths fell open. They turned to each other. Then Willie turned to me and said, Fuck off. What? No way. Sorry. Impossible. I was baffled, until Willie and Kate explained that they were regular, nay, religious, viewers of Suits. Great, I thought, laughing. I've been worrying about the wrong thing. All this time I'd thought Willie and Kate might not welcome Meg into the family, but now I had to worry about them hounding her for an autograph. They barraged me with questions. I told them a bit of how we'd met, told them about Botswana, told them about Waitrose, told them I was smitten, but overall what I told them was heavily redacted. I just didn't want to give away too much. I also said I couldn't wait for them to meet her, that I looked forward to the four of us spending lots of time together, and I confessed, for the umpteenth time, that this had long been my dream, to join them with an equal partner, to become a foursome. I'd said this to Willie so many times, and he'd always replied, it might not happen, Harold, and you've got to be awkward with that. Well, now I felt that it was going to happen, and I told him so, but he still said to slow down. She's an American actress after all, Harold. Anything might happen. I nodded, a bit hurt, then hugged him and Kate and left. Meg came back to London, London a week later. October 2016. We lunched with Marco and his family, and I introduced her to a few other close mates. All good. Everyone loved her. Emboldened, I felt the time had come for her to meet my family. She agreed. First stop, Royal Lodge. To meet Fergie, because Meg already knew Fergie's daughter Huge and Jack, so this seemed a logical baby step. But as we neared Royal Lodge I got word on my phone. Granny was there. She'd popped in. On her way from church back to the castle. Meg said, Fun! I love grandmas. I asked if she knew how to curtsy. She said she thought so. But she also couldn't tell if I was serious. You're about to meet the Queen. I know, but it's your grandma. But she's the Queen. We pulled into the driveway, drove across the gravel, parked next to the big green box hedge. Fergie came outside, somewhat a flutter, and said, Do you know how to curtsy? Meg shook her head. Fergie demonstrated once. Meg imitated her. There wasn't time for a more advanced tutorial. We couldn't keep Granny waiting. As we walked towards the door, Fergie and I both leaned into Meg, whispering quick reminders. When you first meet the Queen, it's your majesty. Thereafter, it's just ma'am. Rhymes with ham. Just, whatever you do, don't talk over her, we both said, talking over each other. We entered the large front sitting room, and there she was. Granny, the monarch, Queen Elizabeth Iyer, standing in the middle of the room. She turned slightly. Maid went straight to her and dropped a deep, flawless curtsy. Your Majesty, pleasure to meet you. 
Huge and Jack were near Granny, and they almost seemed to pretend not to know Meg. They were very quiet, very proper. Each gave Meg a quick kiss on the cheek, but it was pure royal. Pure British. There was some bloke standing to the other side of Granny and I thought. Bogey at twelve o'clock. Meg looked to me for a clue as to his identity, but I couldn't help. I'd never seen him before. Yuge whispered into my ear that he was a friend of her mum's. Ah, ok. I looked at him hard. Brilliant. Congratulations on being present for one of the most consequential moments of my life. Granny was dressed for church. A brightly coloured dress and matching hat. I can't recall the colour, I wish I could, but it was bright. Fancy. I could see Meg regretting her jeans and black sweater. I was also regretting my shabby trousers. We didn't plan, I wanted to tell Granny, but she was busy asking about Meg's visit. Great, we said. Wonderful. We asked about the church service. Lovely. It was all very pleasant. Granny even asked Meg what she thought of Donald Trump. This was just before the November 2016 election, so everyone in the world seemed to be thinking and talking about the Republican candidate. Meg thought politics a no-win game, so she changed the subject to Canada. Granny squinted. I thought you were American. I am, but I've been living in Canada for seven years for work. Granny looked pleased. Commonwealth. Good, fine. After twenty minutes, Granny announced she had to be going. My uncle Andrew, seated beside her, holding her handbag, began to escort her out. Huge went with her too. Before reaching the door, Granny looked back to say goodbye to Jack and to Fergie's friend. She locked eyes with Meg, gave a wave and a warm smile. Bye. Bye. Lovely to meet you, ma'am, as she dipped into a curtsy again. Everyone flooded into the room after she'd driven away. The whole vibe changed. Yuge and Jack were their old selves, and someone suggested drinks. Yes, please. Everyone complimented Meg on her curtsy. So good. So deep. After a moment, Meg asked me something about the Queen's assistant. I asked who she was talking about. That man holding the purse. That man who walked her to the door. That wasn't her assistant. Who was it? That was her second son. Andrew. She definitely hadn't googled us. Next was Willie I knew he'd kill me if I let it go another minute. So Meg and I popped over one afternoon, shortly before he and I were due to leave on a shooting trip. Walking up to apartment 1A, under the huge arch, through the courtyard, I felt more nervous than I had before the meeting with Granny. I asked myself why. No answer came to mind. We climbed the grey stone steps, rang the bell. No reply. After a wait, the door opened and there was my big brother, a bit dressed up. Nice trousers, nice shirt, open collar. I introduced Meg, who leaned in and gave him a hug which completely freaked him out. He recoiled. Willie didn't hug many strangers whereas Meg hugged most strangers. The moment was a classic collision of cultures, like flashlight torch, which felt to me both funny and charming. Later, however, looking back, I wondered if it was more than that. Maybe Willie expected Meg to curtsy. It would have been protocol when meeting a member of the royal family for the first time, but she didn't know, and I didn't tell her. When meeting my grandmother, I'd made it clear this is the Queen. But when meeting my brother, it was just Willie, who loved suits. Whatever, Willie got over it. He exchanged a few warm words with Meg, just inside the door, on the checkered floor of their hall. We were then interrupted by his spaniel, Lupo, barking as if we were burglars. Willie hushed Lupo. Where's Kate? Out with the kids. Ah, too bad. Next time. Then it was time to say goodbye. Willie needed to finish packing and we needed to go. Meg gave me a kiss and told us both to have fun on our shooting weekend, and off she went to spend her first night alone at Notcot. 
Over the next few days I couldn't stop talking about her. Now that she and Granny had met, now that she and Willie had met, now that she was no longer a secret within the family, I had so much to say. My brother listened, attentive, always smiling thinly. Boring to hear someone besotted go on and on, I know, but I couldn't stop myself. To his credit, he didn't tease, didn't tell me to shut up. On the contrary, he said what I'd hoped he'd say, even needed him to say. Happy for you, Harold. Weeks later Meg and I drove through the gate, into the lush gardens of Clarence House, which made Meg gasp. You should see them in the spring. Pa designed them himself. I added, in honor of Gangan, -Gan, you know, she lived here before him. I'd mentioned Gangan -Gan to Meg. I'd also mentioned that I used to live here at Karen's house, from when I was nineteen until I was about twenty-eight. After I moved out, Camilla turned my bedroom into her dressing room. I tried not to care, but especially the first time I saw it, I cared. We paused at the front door, five o'clock, on the dot, wouldn't do to be late. Meg looked beautiful and I told her so. She was wearing a black and white dress with a full skirt, patterned with flowers, and when I put my hand on her back I could feel how delicate the material was. Her hair was down, because I suggested she wear it that way. Pa likes it when women wear their hair down. Granny too. She often commented on Kate's beautiful mane. Meg was wearing little makeup, which I'd also suggested, but didn't approve of women who wore a lot. The door opened and we were greeted by Pa's Gurkha butler, and by Leslie, his long-time house manager, who'd also worked for Gan Gan. They led us down the long corridor, past the big paintings and gilt-edged mirrors, along the crimson carpet with the crimson runner, past the big glass cabinet filled with gleaming porcelain and exquisite heirlooms, up the creaky staircase, which rose three steps before jogging right, up another twelve steps, then jogged right again. There, at last, on the landing above us, stood Pei, beside him stood Camilla. Meg and I had rehearsed this moment several times. For Pa, curtsy, say, your royal highness or sir. Maybe a kiss on each cheek if he leans in, otherwise a handshake. For Camilla, no curtsy. Not necessary. Just a quick kiss or handshake. No curtsy. You sure? I didn't think it appropriate. We all went into a large sitting room. The long the waper asked Meg if it was true, as he'd been told, that she was the star of an American soap opera. She smiled. I smiled. I desperately wanted to say, Soap opera? No, that's our family, pay. Meg said she was in a cable drama that aired in the evening. About lawyers. Called Suits. Marvellous, Pa said. How splendid. We came to a round table laid with a white cloth. Beside it stood a trolley with tea. Honey cake. Flapjacks. Sandwiches. Warm crumpets. Crackers with some creamy spread. Shredded basil. Pa's favourite. All surgically laid out. Pa sat with his back to an open window, as far as possible from the popping fire. Camilla sat across from him, her back to the fire. Meg and I sat between them, across from one another. I wolfed down a crumpet with marmite. Meg had two smoked salmon tea sandwiches. We were starving. We'd been so nervous all day that we hadn't eaten. Pa offered her some flapjacks. She loved them. Camilla asked how Meg took her tea, dark or light, and Meg apologized for not knowing. I thought tea was tea. This sparked a rollicking discussion about tea and wine and other libations and Britishisms versus Americanisms, and then we were on to the larger subject of things we all like, which led straight to dogs. Meg talked about her two fur babies, Bogart and Guy, both of whom were rescues. Guy had a particularly sad story. Meg found him at a Kentucky kill shelter after someone abandoned him in deep woods, without food or water. Beagles, she explained, were put down in Kentucky more than in any other state, and when she saw Guy on the shelter's website she fell in love. 
I watched Camilla's face darken. She was the patron of Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, so these kinds of stories always hit her hard. Part 2. He couldn't bear to think of any animal suffering. He was undoubtedly reminded of the time his beloved dog Pooh got lost on the grouse moor in Scotland, probably down a rabbit hole, never to be seen again. The conversation was easy, all four of us talking at once, but then Pa and Meg fell into a quiet chat, and I turned to Camilla, who seemed keener on eavesdropping than talking to her stepson, but alas, she was stuck with me. Soon, we all switched. How weird, I thought, that we're just instinctively observing the same protocol as we would at a state dinner with Granny. Eventually the conversation broadened again to include everyone. We talked about acting and the arts generally. What a struggle it could be to make your way in such a trade, Per said. He had a lot of questions about Meg's career, and he looked impressed by the way she answered. Her confidence, her intelligence, I thought, caught him unawares. And then our time was up. Pei and Camilla had another engagement. Royal life. Heavily regimented, overscheduled, so forth. I made a note to explain all this later to Meg. We all stood. Meg leaned towards Pei. I flinched. Like Willie, Pei wasn't a hugger. Thankfully, she gave him a standard British cheek-to-cheek, -cheek, which he actually seemed to enjoy. I walked Meg out of Clarence's house, into those lush, fragrant gardens, feeling exultant. Well, that's that then, I thought. Welcome to the family. I flew to Toronto end of October 2016. Meg was excited to show me her life, her dogs, her little house, which she adored. And I was eager to see it all, to know every last detail about her. Though I'd snuck into Canada once before, briefly, this would be my first proper visit. We walked the dogs in big, open ravines and parks. We explored the sparsely populated nooks and crannies of her neighborhood. Toronto wasn't London, but it also wasn't Botswana. So be ever cautious, we said. Maintain the bubble. Keep wearing disguises. Speaking of disguises, we invited Euge and Jack to join us for Halloween. And Meg's best friend Marcus. Toronto's Soho House was having a big party and the theme was Apocalypse. Dress accordingly. I mumbled to Meg that I'd not had great luck with themed fancy dress parties, but I'd give it another go. For help with my costume, I turned to a friend, the actor Tom Hardy, before I left home. I'd phoned him to ask if I could borrow his costume from Mad Max. The whole thing. Yes, please, mate. The whole kit. He'd given it all to me before I left Britain. And now I tried it on in Meg's little bathroom. When I came out, she rolled with laughter. It was funny, and a little scary. But the main thing was, I was unrecognizable. Meg, meanwhile, wore torn black shorts, a camo top, fishnet stockings. If that's the apocalypse, I thought, bring on the end of the world. The party was loud, dark, drunk, ideal. Several people did double takes as Meg passed through the rooms, but no one looked twice at her dystopian date. I wished I could wear this disguise every day. I wished I could reuse it the next day and visit her on the set of suits. Then again, maybe not. I'd made the mistake of Goodling and watching some of her love scenes online. I'd witnessed her and a castmate mauling each other in some sort of office or conference room. It would take electric shock therapy to get those images out of my head. I didn't need to see such things live. Still, the point was moot. The next day was Sunday, so she wasn't working. And then everything was rendered moot. Everything was changed forever. Because the next day was when news of our relationship broke wide open. Well, we said, staring anxiously at our phones, it was going to happen eventually. In fact, We'd had a heads up that it was likely to happen that day. We'd been tipped, before heading off to the Halloween apocalypse, that another apocalypse might be coming. More proof that the universe had a wicked sense of humor. Meg, you ready for what's headed our way? Kinda. Are you? Yes. 
We were sitting on her sofa, moments before I left for the airport. Are you scared? Yes. No. Maybe. We're going to be hunted. No two ways about it. I'll just treat it as if we're in the bush. She reminded me of what I'd said in Botswana, when the lions were roaring. Trust me. I'll keep you safe. She believed me then, she said. She believed me now. By the time I touched down at Heathrow, the story had fizzled. It was all unconfirmed, and there were no photos, so there was nothing to fuel it. A moment's reprieve? Maybe, I thought, all will be well. Nah. Calm before the shitstorm. In those first hours and days of November 2016, there was a new low every few minutes. I was shocked and scolded myself for being shocked and for being unprepared. I'd been braced for the usual madness, the standard libels, but I hadn't anticipated this level of unrestrained lying. Above all, I hadn't been ready for the racism. Both the dog whistle racism and the glaring vulgar in-your-face racism. The Daily Mail took the lead. Its headline, Harry's girl is almost straight out of Compton. Subhead, gang scared home of her mother revealed. So will he be dropping in for tea? Another tabloid jumped into the fray with this jaw dropper. Harry to marry into gangster royalty. My face froze. My blood stopped. I was angry, but more. Ashamed. My mother country. Doing this? To her? To us? Really? As if its headline wasn't disgraceful enough. The mail went on to say that Compton had been the scene of 47 crimes in the last week alone. 47. Imagine that. Never mind that Meg had never lived in Compton. Never even lived near it. She'd lived half an hour away, as far from Compton as Buckingham Palace was from Windsor Castle. But forget that, even if she had lived in Compton, years ago or currently, so what? Who cared how many crimes were committed in Compton, or anywhere else, so long as Meg wasn't the one committing them? A day or two later the mail weighed in again, this time with an essay by the sister of London's former mayor Boris Johnson, predicting that Meg would do something, genetically, to the royal family. If there is issue from her alleged union with Prince Harry, the Windsors will thicken their watery, thin blue blood and Spencer pale skin, and ginger hair with some rich and exotic DNA. Sister Johnson further opined that Meg's mother, Doria, was from the wrong side of the tracks, and as stone-cold proof she cited Doria's dreadlocks. This filth was being blasted out to three million Britons, about Doria, lovely Doria, born in Cleveland, Ohio, graduate of Fairfax High School, in a quintessentially middle-class part of Los Angeles. The Telegraph entered the fray with a piece slightly less disgusting, but equally insane, in which the writer examined from all angles the burning question of whether or not I was legally able to marry a gasp, divorcee. God, they were already into her past and looking at her first marriage. Never mind that my father, a divorcee, was currently married to a divorcee, or my aunt, Princess Anne, was a remarried divorcee. The list went on. Divorce in 2016 was deemed by the British press to be a scarlet letter. Next, the son conned through Meg's social media, discovered an old photo of her with a friend and a professional hockey player, and created an elaborate yarn about Meg and the hockey player having a torrid affair. I asked Meg about it. No, he was hooking up with my friend. I introduced them. So I asked the palace lawyer to contact this paper and tell them the story was categorically false and defamatory and to remove it immediately. The paper's response was a shrug and a raised middle finger. You're being reckless, the lawyer told the newspaper's editors. Yon, said the editors. We already knew for a fact that the papers had put private investigators onto Meg and onto everyone in her circle, in her life, even many not in her life, so we knew that they were experts on her background and boyfriends. They were Megologists. They knew more about Meg than anyone in the world apart from Meg, and thus they knew that every word they'd written about her and the hockey player was hot garbage. 
but they continued to answer the palace lawyer's repeated warnings with the same non-answers, which amounted to a mocking taunt. We don't care. I huddled with the lawyer, trying to work out how to protect Meg from this attack and all the others. I spent most of every day, from the moment I opened my eyes until long past midnight, trying to make it stop. Sue them. I kept telling the lawyer over and over. He explained over and over that suing was what the papers wanted. They were hungry for me to sue, because if I sued that would confirm the relationship, and then they could really go to town. I felt wild with rage and guilt. I'd infected Meg and a mother with my contagion, otherwise known as my life. I'd promised her that I'd keep her safe, and I'd already dropped her into the middle of this danger. When I wasn't with the lawyer, I was with Kensington Palace's comms person, Jason. He was very smart, but a tad too cool about this unfolding crisis for my liking. He urged me to do nothing. You're just going to feed the beast. Silence is the best option. But silence wasn't an option. Of all the options, silence was the least desirable, the least defensible. We couldn't just let the press continue to do this to Meg. Even after I'd convinced him that we needed to do something, say something, anything, the palace said no. Courtiers blocked us hard. Nothing can be done, they said, and therefore nothing will be done. I accepted this as final, until I read an essay in the Huffington Post. The essayist said the mild reaction of Britons to this explosion of racism was to be expected, since they were the hairs of racist colonialists. But what was truly unforgivable, she added, was my silence. Mine. I showed the essay to Jason, said we needed a course correction immediately. No more debate, no more discussion. We needed a statement out there. Within a day we had a draft. Strong, precise, angry, honest. I didn't think it would be the end, but maybe the beginning of the end. I read it one last time and asked Jason to let it fly. Just hours before that statement went out, Meg was on her way to see me. She drove to Toronto's Pearson International Airport, Paps chasing her, and made her way carefully through the crowds of travellers, feeling jittery, exposed. The lounge was full, so an Air Canada representative took pity on her and hid her in a side room, even brought her a plate of food. By the time she landed at Heathrow, my statement was everywhere, and changing nothing. The onslaught continued. In fact, my statement generated a whole new onslaught from my family. Pei and Willie were furious. They gave me an earful. My statement made them look bad, they both said. Why in hell? Because they'd never put out a statement for their girlfriends or wives when they were being harassed. So this visit wasn't like previous ones. It was the complete opposite. Instead of walking around Frogmore Gardens, or sitting in my kitchen talking dreamily about the future, or just getting to know each other, we were stressed out, meeting lawyers, searching for ways to combat this madness. As a rule, Meg wasn't looking at the internet. She wanted to protect herself, keep that poison out of her brain. Smart but not sustainable if we were going to wage a battle for her reputation and physical safety. I needed to know exactly what was fact, what was false, and that meant asking her every few hours about something else that had appeared online. Is this true? Is that true? Is there a grain of truth in this? She'd often begin to cry. Why would they say that has? I don't understand. Can they just make stuff up? Yes, they can. And yes, they do. Still, despite the mounting stress, the terrible pressure, we managed to protect our essential bond, never snapping at each other during those few days. As we came to the final hours of her visit, we were solid, happy, and Meg announced she wanted to make me a special goodbye lunch. There was nothing in my fridge, as usual, but there was a Whole Foods down the street. I gave her directions, the safest route, past the palace guards, turn right towards Kensington Palace Gardens, down to Kensington High Street. There's a police barrier, take a right, and you'll see Whole Foods. 
It's massive. You can't miss it. I had an engagement, but I'd be home soon. Baseball cap, jacket, head down, side gate. You'll be fine. I promise. Two hours later, when I got home, I found her inconsolable, sobbing, shaking. What is it? What's happened? She could barely get the story out. She'd dressed just as I'd advised, and she'd run happily, anonymously, up and down the supermarket aisles. But as she rode the escalator, a man approached. Excuse me, do you know where the exit is? Oh, yes, I think it's just up here to the left. Hey, you're on that program. Suits, am I right? My wife loves you. Oh, that's so nice. Thanks. What's your name? Jeff. Nice to meet you, Jeff. Please tell her I said thanks for watching. I will. Can I get a picture? You know, for my mum. Thought you said it was your wife. Oh. Yeah. Eh. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just grocery shopping today. His face changed. Well, even if I can't take a picture with you, that doesn't stop me taking pictures of you. He whipped out his phone and followed her to the deli counter, snapping away while she looked at the turkey. F the turkey, she thought, hurrying to the checkouts. He followed her there too. She got into the coup. Before her were rows and rows of magazines and newspapers, and on all of them, under the most shocking and disgusting headlines, was her. The other customers noticed as well. They looked at the magazines, looked at her, and now they too pulled out their phones, like zombies. Meg caught two cashiers sharing a horrible smile. After paying for her groceries, she walked outside, straight into a group of four men with their iPhones aimed at her. She kept her head down, rushed up Kensington High Street. She was nearly home when a horse-drawn carriage came rolling out of Kensington Palace Gardens. Some sort of parade. The palace gate was blocked. She was forced back along the main road, where the four men picked up the scent again, and chased her all the way to the main gate, screaming her name. When she finally got inside Notcot, she'd phoned her best girlfriends, each of whom asked, Is he worth this, Meg? Is anyone worth this? I put my arms around her, said I was sorry, so sorry. We just held each other, until I slowly became aware of the most delicious smells. I looked around. Hang on. You mean, after all that, you've still made lunch? I wanted to feed you before I left. Three weeks later, I was getting an HIV test at a dropping clinic in Barbados. With Rihanna. Royal life. The occasion was the upcoming World AIDS Day, and I'd asked Rihanna, at the last minute, to join me, help raise awareness across the Caribbean. To my shock, she'd said yes. November 2016. Important day, vital cause, but my head wasn't in the game. I was worried about Meg. She couldn't go home because her house was surrounded by paps. She couldn't go to her mother's house, in Los Angeles, because it too was surrounded by paps. Alone, adrift, she was on break from filming, and it was Thanksgiving time. So I'd reached out to friends who had a house sitting empty in Los Angeles, and they generously offered it to her. Problem solved, for the moment. Still, I was feeling worried and intensely hostile towards the press, and I was now surrounded by press. The same royal reporters. Gazing at them all, I thought. Complicit. Then the needle went into my finger. I watched the blood spurt and remembered all the people, friends and strangers, fellow soldiers, journalists, novelists, schoolmates, who'd ever called me and my family blue bloods. That old chore found for aristocracy, for royalty, I wondered where it had come from. Someone said our blood was blue because it was colder than other people's, but that couldn't be right, could it? My family always said it was blue because we were special, but that couldn't be right either. Watching the nurse channel my blood into a test tube, I thought, red, just like everyone else's. I turned to Rihanna, and we chatted while I awaited the result. 
negative. Now I just wanted to run, find somewhere with Wi-Fi, check on Meg. But it wasn't possible. I had a full slate of meetings and visits, a royal schedule that didn't leave much wiggle room. And then I had to hurry back to the rusty merchant navy ship taking me around the Caribbean. By the time I reached the ship, late that night, the onboard Wi-Fi signal was barely a pulse. I was only able to text Meg, and only if I stood on the bench in my cabin, phone pressed against the porthole. We were connected just long enough for me to learn that she was safe at my friend's house. Better yet, a mother and father had been able to sneak in and spend Thanksgiving with her. Her father had brought an armful of tabloids, however, which he inexplicably wanted to talk about. That didn't go well, and he'd ended up leaving early. While she was telling me the story, the Wi-Fi went out. The merchant ship chugged on to its next destination. I put down the phone and stared out of the porthole at the dark sea. Meg driving home from set noticed five cars following her. Then they started chasing her. Each car was driven by a man, shady looking. Wolfish. It was winter, Canada, so the roads were ice. Plus, the way the cars were spinning around her, cutting her off, running red lights, tailgating her, while also trying to photograph her, she felt sure she was going to be in a crash. She told herself not to panic, not to drive erratically, not to give them what they wanted. Then she phoned me. I was in London, in my own car, my bodyguard driving, and her tearful voice brought me right back to my childhood. Back to Bonroll. She didn't make it, darling boy. I pleaded with Meg to stay calm, keep her eyes on the road. My air controller train took over. I taught her to the nearest police station. As she got out of the car, I could hear, in the background, Paps following her to the door. Come on, Megan, give us a smile. Click, click, click. She told the police what was happening, begged them for help. They had sympathy, or said they did, but she was a public figure, so they insisted there was nothing to be done. She went back to her car, Paps swarming her again and I guided her to her house, through the front door, where she collapsed. I did too, a little. I felt helpless, and this, I realized, was my Achilles heel. I could deal with most things so long as there was some action to be taken. But when I had nothing to do, I wanted to die. There was no real respite for Meg once she was inside her house. Like every previous night, Paps and so-called journalists knocked at her door rang the bell, constantly. Her dogs were losing their minds. They couldn't understand what was happening, why she wasn't answering the door, why the house was under assault. As they howled and paced in circles, she cowered in the corner of her kitchen, on the floor. After midnight, when things quietened down, she dared to peep through the blinds and saw men sleeping in cars outside, engines running. Neighbors told Meg they'd been harassed too. Men had gone up and down the street, asking questions, offering sums of money for any tidbit about Meg, or else a nice juicy lie. One neighbor reported being offered a fortune to mount on their roof, live streaming cameras aimed at Meg's windows. Another neighbor actually accepted the offer, hitched a camera to his roof and pointed it straight at Meg's backyard. Again she contacted the police, who again did nothing. Ontario laws don't prohibit that, she was told. If the neighbor wasn't physically trespassing, he could hook the Hubble telescope up to his house and point it into her backyard, no problem. Meanwhile, in Los Angeles, her mother was being chased every day, to and from her house, to and from the laundrette, to and from work. She was also being libeled. One story called her trailer trash. Another called her a stoner. In fact, she worked in palliative care. She traveled all over Los Angeles to help people at the end of their lives. Paps scaled the walls and fences of many patients she visited. In other words, every day there was yet another person, like Mummy, whose last sound on earth would be a click. Reunited a quiet night at Notcot, preparing dinner together. December 2016 Meg 
and I had discovered that we shared the same favorite food, roast chicken. I didn't know how to cook it, so that night she was teaching me. I remember the warmth of the kitchen, the wonderful smells. Lemon wedges on the cutting board, garlic and rosemary, gravy bubbling in a saucepan. I remember rubbing salt on the skin of the bird, then opening a bottle of wine. Meg put on music. She was expanding my horizons, teaching me about folk music and soul, James Taylor and Nina Simone. It's a new dawn. It's a new day. Maybe the wine went to my head. Maybe the weeks of battling the press had worn me down. For some reason, when the conversation took an unexpected turn, I became touchy. Then angry. Disproportionately, sloppily angry. Meg said something I took the wrong way. It was partly a cultural difference, partly a language barrier, but I was also just oversensitive that night. I thought, why is she having a go at me? I snapped at her, spoke to her harshly, cruelly. As the words left my mouth, I could feel everything in the room come to a stop. The gravy stopped bubbling, the molecules of air stopped orbiting. Even Nana Simon seemed to pause. Meg walked out of the room, disappearing for a full fifteen minutes. I went and found her upstairs. She was sitting in the bedroom. She was calm, but said in a quiet, level tone that she would never stand for being spoken to like that. I nodded. She wanted to know where it came from. I don't know. Where did you ever hear a man speak like that to a woman? Did you overhear adults speak that way when you were growing up? I cleared my throat, looked away. Yes. She wasn't going to tolerate that kind of partner. Or co-parent. That kind of life. She wasn't going to raise children in an atmosphere of anger or disrespect. She laid it all out super clear. We both knew my anger hadn't been caused by anything to do with our conversation. It came from somewhere deep inside somewhere that needed to be excavated, and it was obvious that I could use some help with the job. I've tried therapy, I told her. Willie told me to go. Never found the right person. Didn't work. No, she said softly. Try again. We left Kensington Palace in a dark car, a completely different and unmarked car, both of us hiding in the back. We went through the rear gate, Around 6.30 p.m. my bodyguard said we weren't being followed, so when we got stuck in traffic on Regent Street, we hopped out. We were going to the theatre and didn't want to draw attention by arriving after the show had started. We were so intent on not being late, on watching the clock, that we didn't see them trailing us. In brazen violation of stalking laws, they shot us close to the theatre. From a moving vehicle, through a bus stop window, the shooters, of course, were Tweedledum and Tweedledumber. We didn't love being papped, especially by those two. But we'd managed to elude them for five months. Good run, we said. The next time we got papped was a few weeks later, leaving dinner with Doria, who'd flown in with Meg. The paps got us, but missed Doria, happily. She turned to go to her hotel. We turned with my bodyguards to go to our car. The paps never saw her. I'd been quite nervous about that dinner. It's always nerve-wracking to meet a girlfriend's mother, but especially when you're currently making her daughter's life hell. The Sun had just recently run a front-page headline, Harry's Girl on Pornhub. The story showed images of Meg, from suits, which some perverts had posted on some porn site. The Sun didn't say, of course, that the images were used illegally that Meg knew nothing about them, that Meg had had as much to do with porn as Granny had. It was just a trick, a way to bait readers into buying the paper or clicking on the story. Once the reader discovered there was nothing there, too late. Ad money was in the purse of the sun. We'd fought it, filed a formal complaint, but thankfully the subject didn't come up that night over dinner. We had happier things to discuss. Meg had just done a trip to India with World Vision, working on menstrual health management and education access for young girls, after which she'd taken Doria on a yoga retreat in Goa, a belated celebration of Doria's 60th birthday. 
We were celebrating Doria, celebrating being together, and doing it all at our favorite place, Soho House at 76 Dean Street. On the subject of India, we laughed about the advice I'd given Meg before she'd left. Do not take a photo in front of the Taj Mahal. She'd asked why and I'd said, My mum. I'd explained that my mother had posed for a photo there, and it had become iconic, and I didn't want anyone thinking Meg was trying to mimic my mother. Meg had never heard of this photo and found the whole thing baffling, and I loved her for being baffled. That dinner with Doria was wonderful, but I look back on it now as the end of the beginning. The next day, the pap photos appeared, and there was a new flood of stories, a new surge along the many channels of social media. Racism, misogyny, criminal stupidity, it all increased. Not knowing where else to turn, I phoned Pei. Don't read it, darling boy. It's not that simple, I said angrily. I might lose this woman. She might either decide I'm not worth the bother, or the press might so poison the public that some idiot might do something bad, harm her in some way. It was already happening in slow motion. Death threats. Her workplace on lockdown because someone, reacting to what they'd read, had made a credible threat. She's isolated. I said, and afraid. She hasn't raised the blinds in her house for months, and you're telling me not to read it. He said I was overreacting. This is sadly just the way it is. I appealed to his self-interest. Doing nothing was a terrible look for the monarchy. People out there have strong feelings about what's happening to her pair. They take it personally. You need to understand that. He was unmoved. The address was half an hour from Notcot. Just a quick drive across the Thames, past the park, but it felt like one of my polar journeys. Heart pounding, I took a deep breath, knocked at the door. The woman opened it, welcomed me. She led me down a short corridor to her office. First door on the left. Small room. Windows with Venetian blinds. Right on the busy street. You could hear cars, shoes kicking on the pavement, people talking, laughing. She was fifteen years older than me, but youthful. She reminded me of Tiggy. It was shocking, really. Such a similar vibe. She pointed me to a dark green sofa and took a chair across the room. The day was autumnal, yet I was sweating profusely. I apologized. I overheat easily. Also, I'm a bit nervous. Say no more. She jumped up, ran out. Moments later she returned with a little fan, which she aimed at me. Ah, lovely. Thank you. She waited for me to begin. But I didn't know where to begin. So I began with my mum. I said I was afraid of losing her. She gave me a long searching look. She knew, of course, that I'd already lost my mum. How surreal. To meet a therapist who already knows part of your life story, who's possibly spent beach holidays reading whole books about you. Yes, I've already lost my mum, of course, but I'm afraid that by talking about her, now, here, to a perfect stranger, and perhaps alleviating some of the pain of that loss, I'll be losing her again. I'll be losing that feeling, that presence of her, or what I've always felt as her presence. The therapist squinted. I tried again. You see, the pain, if that's what it is, that's all I have left of her. And the pain is also what drives me. Some days the pain is the only thing holding me together. And also, I suppose, without the pain, well, she might think, I've forgotten her. That sounded silly, but, well, there it was. Most memories of my mother, I explained, with sudden and overwhelming sorrow, were gone. On the other side of the wall. I told her about the wall. I told her I'd spoken to Willie about my lack of memories of our mother. He'd advised me to look through photo albums, which I'd promptly done. Nothing so, my mother wasn't images or impressions. She was mainly just a hole in my heart. And if I healed that hole, patched it up, what then? I asked if all this sounded crazy. No. 
We were silent. A long time. She asked me what I needed. Why are you here? Look, I said. What I need is to be rid of this heaviness in my chest. I need. I need. Yes. To cry? Please, help me cry. The next session I asked if it would be all right for me to lie down. She smiled. I was wondering when you'd ask. I stretched out on the green sofa, tucked a pillow under my neck. I spoke about the physical and emotional suffering. The panic, the anxiety, the sweats. How long has this been going on? Two or three years now. It used to be much worse. I told her about the talk with Cress. During the skiing holiday, the top coming off the bottle, emotions fizzing all over the place. I'd cried a bit then, but it wasn't enough. I needed to cry more, and I couldn't. I got around to talking about the deep rage, the ostensible trigger for seeking her out in the first place. I described the scene with Meg in the kitchen. I shook my head. I vented about my family, Pei and Willie, Camilla. I frequently stopped myself mid-sentence at the sound of passers-by outside the window. If they ever knew, Prince Harry and their yapping about his family, his problems. Oh, the papers would have a field day, which led us on to the subject of the press. Firmer ground, I let fly. My own countryman and countrywoman. I said, showing such contempt, such vile disrespect, to the woman I loved. Sure, the press had been cruel to me through the years, but that was different. I was born into it, and sometimes I'd asked for it, brought it on myself. But this woman has done nothing to deserve such cruelty. And whenever I complained about it, privately or publicly, people just rolled their eyes. They said I was whinging. Said I only pretended to want privacy. Said Meg was pretending as well. Oh, she's getting chased, is she? Wah wah, give us a break. She'll be fine. She's an actress. She's used to paps. In fact, wants them. But no one wanted this. No one could ever get used to it. All those eye rollers couldn't take ten minutes of it. Meg was having panic attacks for the first time in her life. She'd recently received a text from a perfect stranger who knew her address in Toronto and promised to put a bullet into her head. The therapist said I sounded angry. Shit, yes, I was angry. She said that, no matter how valid my complaints, I also sounded stuck. Granted, Meg and I were living through an ordeal, but the Harry who'd snapped at Meg with such anger wasn't this Harry, the reasonable Harry. Lying on this sofa and laying out his case, that was twelve-year-old Harry, traumatized Harry. What you're going through right now is reminiscent of 1997, Harry. But I also fear that part of you is trapped in 1997. I didn't like the sound of that. I felt a bit insulted. Calling me a child seems a bit rude. You say you want truth. You value truth above all. Well. There's the truth. The session went over the allotted time. It lasted nearly two hours. When our time was up, we made a date to get together again soon. I asked if it would be all right if I gave her a hug. Yes, of course. I embraced her lightly, thanked her. Outside on the street, my head was swimming. In each direction, there was an amazing collection of restaurants and shops, and I'd have given anything to walk up and down. Look in the windows. Give myself time to process all I'd said and learned, but of course, impossible. Didn't want to cause a scene. The therapist, it so happened, had met Tiggy. Astounding coincidence. Smallest of all possible worlds. So in another session, we talked about Tiggy, how she'd been a surrogate mum to me and Willie, how Willie and I had often turned women into surrogate mums. How often they'd eagerly cast themselves in that role. Surrogate mums made me feel better, I admitted, and worse, because I felt guilty. What would mummy think? We talked about guilt. I mentioned mummy's experience with therapy, as I understood it. Didn't help her.
might have made things worse, actually. So many people preyed on her, exploited her, including therapists. We talked about Mummy's parenting, how she could sometimes overmother, then disappear for stretches. It seemed an important discussion, but also disloyal. More guilt. We talked about life inside the British bubble, inside the royal bubble. A bubble inside a bubble. Impossible to describe to anyone who hasn't actually experienced it. People simply didn't realize. They heard the word royal or prince and lost all rationality. Ah, a prince, you have no problems. They assumed. No, they'd been taught. It was all a fairy tale. We weren't human. A writer many Britons admired, a writer of thick historical novels that racked up literary prizes, had penned an essay about my family, in which she said we were simply pandas. Our current royal family doesn't have the difficulties in breeding that pandas do, but pandas and royal persons alike are expensive to conserve and ill-adapted to any modern environment. But aren't they interesting? Aren't they nice to look at? I'll never forget the highly respected essayist who wrote in Britain's most highly respected literary publication that my mother's early death spared us all a lot of tedium. He referred in the same essay to Diana's tryst with the underpass. But this panda crack always struck me as both acutely perceptive and uniquely barbarous. We did live in a zoo, but by the same token I knew, as a soldier, that turning people into animals, into non-people, is the first step in mistreating them, in destroying them. If even a celebrated intellectual could dismiss us as animals, what hope for the man or woman on the street? I gave the therapist an overview of how this dehumanization had played out in the first half of my life. But now, with the dehumanizing of Meg, there was so much more hate more vitriol, plus racism. I told her what I'd seen, heard, witnessed over the last few months. At one point I sat up on the couch, crooked my neck to see if she was listening. Her mouth was hanging open. A lifelong resident of Britain, she thought she knew. She didn't know. At the end of the session I asked her professional opinion. Is what I'm feeling normal? She laughed. What's normal, anyway? But she conceded that one thing was abundantly clear. I found myself in highly unusual circumstances. Do you think I have an addictive personality? More accurately, what I wanted to know was, if I did have an addictive personality, where would I be right now? Hard to say. Hypotheticals, you know. She asked if I'd use drugs. Yes. I told her some wild stories. Well, I am rather surprised you're not a drug addict. If there was one thing to which I did seem undeniably addicted, however, it was the press. Reading it, raging at it, she said, these were obvious compulsions. I laughed. True, but they're such shit. She laughed. They are. I always thought Cressida had performed a miracle, opening me up releasing suppressed emotions. But she'd only started the miracle, and now the therapist brought it to completion. All my life I'd told people I couldn't remember the past, couldn't remember my mum, but I never gave anyone the full picture. My memory was dead. Now, through months of therapy, my memory twitched, kicked, sputtered. It came to life. Some days I'd open my eyes to find mummy, standing before me, a thousand images returned, some so bright and vivid that they were like holograms. I remembered mornings in Mummy's apartment at Kensington Palace, the nanny waking Willie and me, helping us down to Mummy's bedroom. I remembered that she had a waterbed, and Willie and I would jump up and down on the mattress, screaming, laughing, our hair standing straight up. I remembered the breakfast together, Mummy loving grapefruit and lychees, seldom drinking coffee or tea. I remembered that after breakfast we'd embark on the working day with her, sitting by her side during her first phone calls, auditing her business meetings. I remembered Willie and me joining her for a chat with Christy Turlington, Claudia Schiffer and Cindy Crawford. Very confusing, especially for two shy boys, at or about the age of puberty. 
I remembered bedtimes in Kensington Palace, saying good night at the foot of the stairs, kissing her soft neck, inhaling her perfume, then lying in bed, in the dark, feeling so far away, so alone, and longing to hear her voice just one more time. I remembered my bedroom being the farthest from hers, and in the dark, in the terrible silence, being unable to relax, unable to let go. The therapist urged me to press on. We're breaking through, she said. Let's not stop. I brought to her office a bottle of Mummy's favorite perfume. I'd reached out to Mummy's sister, asked for the name. First, by Van Cleef and Arpels. At the start of our session I lifted the lid, took a deep sniff. Like a tab of LSD. I read somewhere that smell is our oldest sense, and that fitted with what I experienced in that moment, images rising from what felt like the most primal part of my brain. I remembered one day at Lugrove, Mummy stuffing sweets into my sock. Outside sweets were forbidden, so Mummy was flouting school rules, giggling as she did so, which made me love her even more. I remembered both of us laughing as we buried the sweets deep in the sock, and me squealing. Oh, Mummy, you're so naughty. I remembered the brand of those sweets. Opal fruits. Hard squares of bright colors, not unlike these resurrected memories. No wonder I was so keen on grub days. And opal fruits. I remembered going to tennis lessons in the car, Mummy driving, Willie and me in the back. Without warning she trod on the accelerator and we went rocketing ahead. Up narrow streets, blasting through red lights, whipping around corners. Willie and I were strapped into our seats, so we couldn't look out of the back window, but we had a sense of what was chasing us. Paps on motorbikes and mopeds. Are they going to kill us, Mummy? Are we going to die? Mummy, wearing big sunglasses, peering into the mirrors. After fifteen minutes and several near smashes Mummy slammed on the brakes, pulled over, jumped out and walked towards the paps. Leave us alone. For God's sake, I'm with my children, can't you leave us alone? Trembling, pink-cheeked, she got back into the car, slammed the door, rolled up the windows, leaned her head on the steering wheel and wept while the paps kept clicking and clicking. I remembered the tears falling from her big sunglasses, and I remembered Willie looking frozen, like a statue, and I remembered the paps just firing and firing and firing, and I remembered feeling such hatred for them and such deep and eternal love for everyone in that car. I remembered being on holiday, Necco Island, all three of us sitting in a cliffside hut, and here came a boat with a gang of photographers, looking for us. We'd been playing with water balloons that day and we had a bunch of them lying about. Mummy quickly rigged up a catapult and divided the balloons among us. On the count of three we began raining them down on the heads of the photographers. The sound of her laughter that day, lost to me all these years, was back. It was back. Loud and clear as the traffic outside the therapist's windows. I cried with joy to hear it. The sun ran a correction for their porn story in a tiny box on page two, where no one would see it. What did it matter? The damage had been done. Plus it cost Meg tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees. I rang Pa yet again. Don't raid it, darling. I cut him off. I wasn't about to hear that nonsense again. Also, I wasn't a boy anymore. I tried a new argument. I reminded Pa that these were the same shoddy bastards who'd been portraying him as a clone all his life, ridiculing him for sounding the alarm about climate change. These were his tormentors, his bullies, and now they were tormenting and bullying his son and his son's girlfriend. Did that not inspire his outrage? Why have I got to beg you, Pa? Why is this not already a priority for you? Why is this not causing you anguish, keeping you up at night? that the press are treating Meg like this. You adore her, you told me so yourself. You bonded over your shared love of music, you think she's funny and witty and impeccably mannered. You told me, so why pay? Why? I couldn't get a straight answer. 
The conversation went in circles, and when we hung up I felt abandoned. Meg, meanwhile, reached out to Camilla, who tried to counsel her by saying this was just what the press always did to newcomers, that it would all pass in due time, that Camilla had been the bad guy once. The implication being what? Now it was Meg's turn, as if it were apples to apples. Camilla also suggested to Meg that I become Governor General of Bermuda, which would solve all our problems by removing us from the red-hot centre of the maelstrom. Right, right, I thought, and one added bonus of that plan would be to get us out of the picture. In desperation I went to Willie. I took advantage of the first quiet moment I'd had with him in years. The end of August 2017, at Althorpe. 20th anniversary of Mummy's death. We rowed the little boat out to the island. The bridge had been removed, to give my mother privacy, to keep intruders away. We each had a bouquet of flowers, which we set on the grave. We stood there a while, having our own thoughts, and then we talked about life. I gave him a quick summary of what Meg and I had been dealing with. Don't worry, Harold. No one believes that shit. Not true. They do. It's drip-fed to them, day by day, and they come to believe it without even being aware. He didn't have a satisfying answer for that, so we were silent. Then he said something extraordinary. He said he thought Mummy was here. Meaning, among us. Yes, me too, Willie. I think she's been in my life, Harold. Guiding me. Setting things up for me. I think she's helped me start a family. And I feel as though she's helping you now too. I nodded. Totally agree. I feel as though she helped me find Meg. Willie took a step back. He looked concerned. That seemed to be taking things a bit far. Well, now, Harold, I'm not sure about that. I wouldn't say that. Meg came to London September 2017. We were in Not Cot, in the kitchen, preparing dinner. The whole cottage was filled with love, filled to overflowing. It even seemed to spill out the open door into the garden outside, a scrubby little patch of ground that no one had wanted for a very long time, at which Meg and I had slowly reclaimed. We'd raked and mown, planted and watered, and many evenings we sat out there on a blanket listening to classical music concerts wafting over from the park. I told Meg about the garden just on the other side of our wall, Mummy's garden, where Willie and I played as kids. It was now sealed off from us forever, as my memories had once been. Whose garden is it now? she asked. It belongs to Princess Michael of Kent and her Siamese cats. Mummy despised those cats as I smelled the garden and considered this new life, cherished this new life, Meg was sitting on the other side of the kitchen, scooping Wagamama from cartons into bowls. Without thinking, I blurted out, I don't know, I just... I had my back to her. I froze, mid-sentence, hesitant to go on, hesitant to turn around. You don't know what has... I just... Yes. I love you. I listened for a response. There was none. Now I could hear her, or feel her, walking towards me. I turned and there she was, right before me. I love you too, has. The words had been on the tip of my tongue almost from the start, so in one sense they didn't feel particularly revelatory, or even necessary. Of course I loved her. Meg knew that. Meg could see it. The whole world could. I loved her with all my heart as I'd never loved anyone before, and yet saying it made everything real. Saying it set things in motion, automatically. Saying it was a step. It meant we now had a few more very big steps ahead. Like, moving in together. I asked if she'd consider moving to Britain, moving into Not Cot with me. We talked about all that would mean, and how it would work, and what she'd be giving up, we talked about the logistics of winding down her life in Toronto. When, and how, and above all, for what? Exactly? I can't just leave my show and quit my job to give it a shot. Would moving to Britain mean a forever commitment? Yes, I said. 
It would. In that case, she said with a smile, yes. We kissed, hugged, sat down to our supper. I sighed. On the road, I thought. But later, after she'd fallen asleep, I analyzed myself. A holdover from therapy, perhaps. I realized that, mixed in with all my roiling emotions, there was a big streak of relief. She'd said it back, the actual words, I love you, and it hadn't been inevitable, it hadn't been a formality. Part of me, I couldn't deny, had been braced for the worst case. Has. I'm sorry, but I just don't know if I can do this. Part of me feared she'd bolt. Go back to Toronto, change her number. Heed the advice of her girlfriends. Is anyone worth this? Part of me thought she'd be smart to do so. By pure chance, the 2017 Invictus Games were going to be in Toronto. Meg's backyard. Perfect occasion, the palace decided, for our first official public outing. Meg was a bit nervous. Me too, but we had no choice. As to be done, we said. We've hidden from the world long enough. Also, this would be the most controlled, predictable environment we could ever hope for. Above all, once we did a public date, it might reduce the bounty on our heads among the paps, which at that point was running at around a hundred thousand pounds. We tried to make the whole thing as normal as possible. We watched wheelchair tennis from the front row, focused on the game and the good cause, ignored the wear of cameras. We managed to have fun, to track a few jokes with some kiwis sitting beside us, and the photos that appeared the following day were sweet, though several in the British press slammed Meg for wearing ripped jeans. No one mentioned that everything she wore, down to the flats and button-down shirt, had been pre-approved by the palace. And by no one, I mean not anyone at the palace. One statement, that week, in defense of Meg, it might have made a world of difference. I told Elf and Jason that I wanted to propose. Congratulations, both men said. But then Elf said he'd need to do some fast digging, find out the protocols. There were strict rules governing such things. Rules? Really? He came back days later and said before doing anything I'd need to ask Granny's permission. I asked him if that was a real rule or the kind we could work around. Oh, no, it's very real. It didn't make sense. A grown man asking his grandmother for permission to marry? I couldn't recall Willie asking before he proposed to Kate. Or my cousin Peter asking before he proposed to his wife, Autumn. But come to think of it, I did remember Per asking permission when he wanted to marry Camilla. The absurdity of a 56-year-old man asking his mother's permission had been lost on me at the time. Elf said there was no point in examining the whys and hows. This was the inalterable rule. The first six in line to the throne had to ask permission. The Royal Marriages Act of 1772, or the Succession to the Crown Act of 2013. He was going on and on, and I could barely believe my ears. The point was, love took a decided backseat to law. Indeed, law had trumped love on more than one occasion. A fairly recent relative had been strongly dissuaded from marrying the love of their life. Boo! Your Aunt Margaret. Really? Yes. She'd wanted to marry a divorcee and, well, divorcee? Elf nodded. Oh, shit, I thought. This might not be a slam dunk, but Pa and Camilla were divorcees, I said, and they'd got permission. Didn't that mean the rule no longer applied? That's them, Elf said. This is you. To say nothing about the Fuhrer over a certain king who'd wanted to marry an American divorcee, which Elf reminded me had ended with the king's application and exile. Duke of Windsor. Ever heard of him? And so, heart full of fear, mouth full of dust, I turned to the calendar. With Elf's help I circled a weekend in late October. A family shooting trip at Sandringham. Shooting trips always put Granny in a good mood. Perhaps she'd be more open to thoughts of love. Cardi blustery day, I jumped into the venerable old Land Rover, the ancient army ambulance that Grandpa had reproposed. 
Pay was behind the wheel. Willie was in the back. I got into the passenger seat and wondered if I should tell them both what I was intending. I decided against it. But already knew, I assumed, and Willie had already warned me not to do it. It's too fast, he told me. Too soon. In fact, he'd actually been pretty discouraging about my even dating Meg. One day, sitting together in his garden, he predicted a host of difficulties I could expect if I hooked up with an American actress. A phrase he always managed to make sound like, convicted felon. Are you sure about her, Harold? I am, Willie. But do you know how difficult it's going to be? What do you want me to do? Fall out of love with her? The three of us were wearing flat caps, green jackets, plus fours, as if we played for the same sports team. In a way, I suppose we did. Pei, driving us out into the fields, asked about Meg. Not with great interest, just casually. Still, he didn't always ask, so I was pleased. She's good, thanks. Does she want to carry on working? Say again. Does she want to keep on acting? Oh, I mean, I don't know, I wouldn't think so. I expect she'll want to be with me, doing the job, you know, which would rule out suits. Since they film in Toronto. Hmm. I see. Well, darling boy. You know there's not enough money to go around. I stared. What was he banging on about? He explained. Or tried to. I can't pay for anyone else. I'm already having to pay for your brother and Catherine. I flinched. Something about his use of the name Catherine. I remembered the time he and Camilla wanted Kate to change the spelling of her name, because there were already two royal surfers with a C and a crown above. Charles and Camilla. It would be too confusing to have another. Make it Catherine with a K, they suggested. I wondered now what came of that suggestion. I turned to Willie, gave him a look that said, You listening to this? His face was blank. I didn't financially support Willie and me and our families out of any largesse. That was his job. That was the whole deal. We agreed to serve the monarch, go wherever we were sent, do whatever we were told, surrender our autonomy, keep our hands and feet inside the gilded cage at all times, and in exchange the keepers of the cage agreed to feed and clothe us. Was Pa, with all his millions from the hugely lucrative Duchy of Cornwall, trying to say that our captivity was starting to cost him a bit too much? Besides which, how much could it possibly cost to house and feed Meg? I wanted to say, she doesn't eat much, you know. And I'll ask her to make her own clothes, if you like. It was suddenly clear to me that this wasn't about money. Pa might have dreaded the rising cost of maintaining us, but what he really couldn't stomach was someone new dominating the monarchy. Grabbing the limelight. Someone shiny and new coming in and overshadowing him. And Camilla. He'd lived through that before and had no interest in living through it again. I couldn't deal with any of that right now. I had no time for petty jealousies and palace intrigue. I was still trying to work out exactly what to say to Granny, and the time had come. The Land Rover stopped. We piled out and lined up along the hedge being placed by Pa. We waited for the birds to appear. The wind was blowing, and my mind was all over the place. But as the first drive began I found that I was shooting well. I got into the zone. Maybe it was a relief to think about something else. Maybe I preferred focusing on the next shot rather than the big shot I was planning to take. I just kept swinging that barrel, squeezing that trigger, hitting every target. We broke for lunch. I tried, repeatedly, but wasn't able to get Granny by herself. Everyone was surrounding her talking her ear off. So I tucked into the meal, biding my time. A classic royal shooting luncheon. Cold feet warming by the fires, toasty potatoes, juicy meat, creamy soups, staff overseeing every detail. Then perfect puds. Then a little tea, a drink or two. Then back to the birds. 
During the day's final two drives, I was constantly sneaking peeks in Granny's direction to see how she was doing. She seemed good and very locked in. Did she really have no idea what was coming? After the final drive, the party scattered. Everyone finished picking up their birds and returned to the Land Rovers. I saw Granny jump into her smaller Range Rover and drive out to the middle of the stubble field. She began looking for dead birds while her dogs hunted. There was no security around her, so this looked to be my chance. I walked out to the middle of the stubble field, fell in alongside her, began helping. While we scanned the ground for dead birds, I tried to engage her in some light chat to loosen her up and to loosen up my vocal cords. The wind was stronger and Granny's cheeks looked cold, despite the scarf wrapped tightly around her head. Not helping matters. My subconscious. It was popping. The full seriousness of all this was finally starting to sink in. If Granny said no, would I have to say goodbye to Meg? I couldn't imagine being without her, but I also couldn't imagine being openly disobedient to Granny. My queen, my commander-in-chief. If she withheld her permission, my heart would break, and of course I'd look for another occasion to ask again, but the odds would be against me. Granny wasn't exactly known for changing her mind. So this moment was either the start of my life or the end. It would all come down to the words I chose, how I delivered them, and how Granny heard them. If all that wasn't enough to make me tongue-tied, I'd seen plenty of press reports, sourced to the palace, that some in my family didn't quite, shall we say, approve of Meg. Didn't fancy her directness. Didn't feel altogether comfortable with her strong work ethic. Didn't even enjoy her occasional questions. What was healthy and natural inquisitiveness they deemed to be impertinence. There were also whispers about a vague and pervasive unease regarding her race. Concern had been expressed in certain corners about whether or not Britain was ready. Whatever that meant. Was any of that rubbish reaching Granny's ears? If so, was this request for permission merely a hopeless exercise? Was I doomed to be the next Margaret? Oh, a barrow. Wow. I thought back over the many hinge moments in my life when permission was required. Requesting permission from Control to fire on the enemy. Requesting permission from the Royal Foundation to create the Invictus Games. I thought of pilots requesting permission from me to cross my airspace. My life all at once felt like an endless series of permission requests, all of them a prelude to this one. Granny started walking back to her Range Rover. I quick-stepped after her, the dogs circling my feet. Looking at them, my mind began to race. My mother used to say that being around Granny and the Corges was like standing on a moving carpet, and I used to know most of them living and dead, as if they were my cousins, Dookie, Emma, Susan, Linnet, Pickles, Chipper. They were all said to descend from the gorges that belonged to Queen Victoria. The more things change, the more they stay the same. But these weren't gorges. These were hunting dogs, and they had a different purpose. And I had a different purpose. And I realized that I needed to get to it, without one second more of hesitation. So, as Granny lowered the tailgate, as the dogs leaped up, as I thought of petting them, but then remembered I had a dead bird in each hand, their limp necks nestled between my fingers, their glazed eyes rolled all the way back. I feel you, birds. Their bodies still warm through my gloves. I turned instead to Granny and saw her turn to me and frown. Did she recognize that I was afraid? Of both the request for permission and of Her Majesty? Did she realize that, no matter how much I loved her, I was often nervous in her presence, and I saw her waiting for me to speak, and not waiting patiently. Her face radiated. Out with it. I coughed. Granny, you know I love Meg very much, and I've decided that I would like to ask her to marry me, and I've been told that, uh, that I have to ask your permission before I can propose. You have to. Um. Well, yes, that's what your staff tell me, and my staff as well. That I have to ask your permission. I stood completely still, 
as motionless as the birds in my hands. I stared at her face, but it was unreadable. At last she replied, Well then, I suppose I have to say yes. I squinted. You feel you have to say yes? Does that mean you are saying yes, but that you want to say no? I didn't get it. Was she being sarcastic? Ironic? Deliberately cryptic? Was she indulging in a bit of wordplay? I'd never known Granny to do any wordplay, and this would be a surpassingly bizarre moment, not to mention wildly inconvenient, for her to start. But maybe she just saw the chance to play off my unfortunate use of the word have and couldn't resist. Or else, perhaps there was some hidden meaning beneath the wordplay, some message I wasn't comprehending. I stood there squinting, smiling, asking myself over and over, what is the Queen of England saying to me right now? At long last I realized, she's saying yes, you muppet. She's granting permission. Who cares how she words it, just know when to take yes for an answer. So I sputtered. Right. Oak, granny. Well, fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. I wanted to hug her. I longed to hug her. I didn't hug her. I saw her into the Range Rover, then marched back to Pa and Willie. I took a ring from Meg's jewelry box and gave it to a designer so he'd know her size, since he was also the keeper of Mummy's bracelets, earrings and necklaces. I asked him to harvest the diamonds from one particularly beautiful bracelet of Mummy's and use those to create a ring. I'd cleared all this in advance with Willie. I'd asked my brother if I could have the bracelet and told him what it was for. I don't recall him hesitating, for one second, in giving it to me. He seemed to like Meg, despite his off-sighted concerns. Kate seemed to like her too. We'd have them over for dinner during one of Meg's visits, and Meg cooked, and everything was good. Willie had a cold. He was sneezing and coughing, and Meg ran upstairs to get him some of her homeopathic cures. Oregano oil turmeric. He seemed charmed, moved, though Kate announced to the table that he'd never take such unconventional remedies. We talked about Wimbledon that night and suits, and Willie and Kate weren't brave enough to admit to being superfans, which was sweet. The only possibly discordant note I could think of was the marked difference in how the two women dressed, which both of them seemed to notice. Meg, ripped jeans, barefoot. Kate, done up to the nines. No big deal, I thought. Along with the diamonds from the bracelet I'd asked the designer to add a third, a blood-free diamond from Botswana. He asked if there was a rush. Well, now that you mention it. Meg packed up her house, gave up her role in suits. After seven seasons. A difficult moment for her, because she loved that show, loved the character she was playing, loved her cast and crew, loved Canada. On the other hand, life there had become untenable, especially on set. The show writers were frustrated because they were often advised by the palace comms team to change lines of dialogue, what her character would do, how she would act. She'd also shut down her website and abandoned all social media, again at the behest of the palace comms team. She'd said goodbye to her friends, goodbye to her car, goodbye to one of her dogs, Bogart. He'd been so traumatized by the siege of her house, by the constant ringing of the doorbell, that his demeanor changed when Meg was around. He'd become an aggressive guard dog. Meg's neighbors had graciously agreed to adopt him. But Guy came. Not my friend, Meg's other dog, her beat-up little beagle, who was even more beat-up of late. He missed Bogart, of course, but more, he was badly injured. Days before Meg left Canada, Guy had run away from his minder. Meg was at work. He'd been found miles from Meg's house, unable to walk. His legs were now in casts. I often had to hold him upright so he could pee. I didn't mind in the least. I loved that dog. I couldn't stop kissing him, petting him. Yes, my intense feelings for Meg spilled over onto anyone or anything she loved but also I'd wanted a dog for so long, 
and I'd never been able to have one because I'd been such a nomad. One night, not long after Meg's arrival in Britain, we were at home, making dinner, playing with Guy, and the kitchen of Not Cot was as full of love as any room I'd ever been in. I opened a bottle of champagne, an old, old gift I'd been saving for a special occasion. Meg smiled. What's the occasion? No occasion. I scooped up Guy, carried him outside, into the walled garden, put him down on a blanket I'd spread on the grass. Then I ran back inside and asked Meg to grab her champagne flute and come with me. What's up? Nothing. I led her out to the garden. Cold night. We were both wrapped in big coats, and hers had a hood lined with fake fur that framed her face like a cameo. I set electric candles around the blanket. I wanted it to look like Botswana, the bush, where I'd first thought of proposing. Now I knelt on the blanket, Guy at my side. Both of us looked up searchingly at Meg. My eyes already full of tears, I brought the ring out of my pocket and said my piece. I was shivering, and my heart was audibly thumping and my voice was unsteady, but she got the idea. Spend your life with me? Make me the happiest guy on this planet. Yes. 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 I laughed. She laughed. What other reaction could there be? In this mixed-up world, this pain-filled life, we'd done it. We'd managed to find each other. Then we were crying and laughing and petting Guy, who looked frozen solid. We started for the house. Oh, wait, don't you want to see the ring, my love? She hadn't even thought about it. We hurried inside, finished our celebration in the warmth of the kitchen. It was November 4. We managed to keep it secret for about two weeks. Ordinarily, I'd have gone to Meg's father first, asked for his blessing. But Thomas Markle was a complicated man. He and Meg's mother split when she was two, and thereafter she divided her time between them. Monday to Friday with Mum, weekends with Dad. Then, for part of high school, she'd moved in with her father full-time. They were that close. After college she'd travelled the world, but always stayed in constant contact with Daddy. She still, even in her thirties, called him Daddy. She loved him, worried about him his health, his habits, and often relied upon him. Throughout her run on suits, she consulted him every week about the lighting. He'd been a lighting director in Hollywood, won two Emmys. In recent years, however, he hadn't been working regularly, and he'd sort of disappeared. He'd rented a small house in a Mexican border town and wasn't doing well overall. In every way, Meg felt, her father would never be able to withstand the psychological pressures that come with being stalked by the press, and that was now happening to him. It had long been open season on everyone in Meg's circle, every current friend and ex-boyfriend, every cousin, including those she'd never known, every former employer or former co-worker. But after I proposed there was a frenzy around the father. He was considered the prize catch. When the Daily Mirror published his location, Paps descended on his house, taunting him, trying to tempt or lure him outside. No fox hunt, no bear baiting was ever more depraved. Strange men and women dangled offers of money, gifts, friendship. When none of that worked, they rented the house next door and shot him day and night through his windows. The press reported that, as a result, Meg's father had nailed plywood over his windows. But this wasn't true. He'd often had plywood nailed over his windows, even when living in Los Angeles, well before Meg started dating me. Complicated man. They'd then begun following him into town, tailing him on his errands, walking behind him as he went up and down the aisles of local shops. They'd run photos of him with the headline, Got him. Meg would often phone her father, urge him to remain calm. Don't speak to them, Daddy. Ignore them, they'll go away eventually, as long as you don't react. That's what the palace says to do. It was hard for both of us, while dealing with all that, to focus on the million and one details of planning a royal wedding. Strangely, 
the palace had trouble focusing too. We wanted to get married quickly. Why give the papers and paps time to do their worst? But the palace couldn't seem to pick a date. Or a venue. While waiting for a decree from on high, from the nebulous upper regions of the royal decision-making apparatus, we went off on a traditional engagement tour. England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales. We travelled up and down, and all over the UK, introducing Meg to the public. Crowds went wild for her. Meg, Diana would have loved you. I heard women scream this again and again. A total departure from the tone and tenor of the tabloids, and also a reminder. The British press wasn't reality. On our return from that trip, I rang Willie, sounded him out, asked his thoughts about where we might get married. I told him we were thinking of Westminster Abbey. No good. We did it there. Right, right, Saint. Paul's? Too grand. Plus pay and mummy did it there. Come. Yes. Good point. He suggested Tetbury. I snorted. Tetbury? The chapel near Highgrove. Seriously, Willie? How many does that place seat? Isn't that what you said you wanted? A small, quiet wedding? In fact, we wanted to elope. Barefoot in Botswana, with maybe a friend officiating. That was our dream. But we were expected to share this moment with other people. It wasn't up to us. I turned back to the palace. Any progress on a date? A venue? Nope, was the reply. How about March? Alas, March was all booked. How about June? Sorry, gar today. At last they came to us with a date, May 2018. And they accepted our request for the location. Saint. George's Chapel. That settled, we made our first public outing with Willie and Kate. The Royal Foundation Forum. February 2018. All four of us sat on a stage while a woman asked us softball questions before a fairly good-sized audience. The foundation was nearing ten years of existence, and we spoke about its past while looking to its future with us four at the helm. The audience was keen, all four of us were having fun, the whole atmosphere was hugely positive. Afterwards, one journalist dubbed us the Fab Four. Here we go, I thought hopefully. Days later, controversy. Something about Meg showing support for hashtag Metu, and Kate not showing support, via their outfits. I think that was the gist, though who can say? It wasn't real, but I think it had Kate on edge, while putting her and everyone else on notice that she was now going to be compared to, and forced to compete with, Meg. All this came on the heels of an awkward moment backstage. Meg asked to borrow Kate's lip gloss, an American thing. Meg forgot hers, worried she needed some, and turned to Kate for help. Kate, taken aback, went into her handbag and reluctantly pulled out a small tube. Meg squeezed some onto her finger and applied it to her lips. Kate grimaced. Small clutch of styles, maybe. Something we should have been able to laugh about soon after. But it left a little mark. And then the press sensed something was up and tried to turn it into something bigger. Here we go, I thought sorrowfully. Granny formally approved the marriage in March 2018. By royal decree. Meanwhile, Meg and I were already a growing family. We brought home a new puppy, a sibling for little guy. He'd been needing one poor thing. So when a friend in Norfolk told me his black Labrador had a litter, and offered me a gorgeous amber-eyed female. I couldn't say no. Meg, and I named her Pula. The sets won a word for rain. And good fortune. Many mornings I'd wake to find myself surrounded by beings I loved, who loved me and depended on me, and I thought I simply had no right to this much good fortune. Work challenges aside, this was happiness. Life was good and following along a predestined track, seemingly. The decree about the wedding coincided uncannily with the airing of Meg's farewell season of suits, in which her character, Rachel, was also preparing to get married. 
art and life, imitating each other. Decent of suits. I thought, marry Meg off the show, instead of pushing her down a lift shaft. There were enough people in real life trying to do that. That spring, however, the press was quieter. Keener about breaking news of wedding details than inventing new libels. Each day there was another world exclusive about the flowers, the music, the food, the cake. No detail too small, not even the portaloos. It was reported that we'd be providing the poshest portaloos on earth. Porcelain basins, gold-plated seats. After being inspired by the ones at Pippa Middleton's wedding. In reality, we didn't notice anything different about how or where people went pee or poo at Pippa's and we had nothing to do with choosing the portaloos for ours. But we sincerely hoped that everyone would be able to do their thing in comfort and peace. Above all, we hoped the royal correspondents would continue to write about poo instead of trying to stir it up. So when the palace encouraged us to feed more wedding details to those correspondents, known as the royal rota, we obeyed. At the same time, I told the palace that on the big day, the happiest day of our lives, I didn't want to see one single royal correspondent inside that chapel, unless Murdoch himself apologized for phone hacking. The palace scoffed. It would be all-out war, the courtiers warned, to bar the royal rota from the wedding. Then let's go to war. I'd had it with the royal rota, both the individuals and the system, which was more outdated than the horse and cart. It had been devised some forty years earlier, to give British print and broadcast reporters first crack at the royal family, and it stank to high heaven. It discouraged fair competition, engendered cronyism, encouraged a small mob of hacks to feel entitled. After weeks of wrangling, it was agreed. The royal rota wouldn't be allowed in the chapel, but they could gather outside. A small win, which I hugely celebrated. Pa wanted to help choose the music for the ceremony, so he invited us one night to Clarence House for dinner and a concert. He brought out his wireless, and we began sampling music, wonderful music, all kinds of music. He wholly endorsed our desire to have an orchestra rather than an organist, and he played an assortment of orchestras to get us in the mood. After a time, we sagged into classical, and he talked about his love of Beethoven. Meg spoke about her own deep feeling for Chopin. She'd always loved Chopin, she said, but in Canada she grew dependent on him, because Chopin was the only thing that could soothe Guy and Bogart. She played them Chopin day and night. Pess smiled sympathetically. As one piece ended, he'd quickly reload his wireless, begin humming or tapping his foot to the next. He was airy, witty, charming, and I kept shaking my head in amazement. I knew Pa loved music, but I never knew he loved it this much. Meg evoked so much in him, qualities I'd rarely seen. In her presence Pa became boyish. I saw it, saw the bond between them growing stronger, and I felt strengthened in my own bond with him. So many people were treating her shabbily. It filled my heart to see my father treating her like the princess she was about to may be born to, become. After all the stress granny for permission to marry Meg, I thought I'd never have the courage to ask her for anything else. And yet I now dared to make another ask. Granny, please, may I, for my wedding, keep my beard? Not a small ask either. A beard was thought by some to be a clear violation of protocol and long-standing norms, especially since I was getting married in my army uniform. Beards were forbidden in the British Army. But I was no longer in the Army, and I desperately wanted to hang on to something that had become an effective check on my anxiety. Illogical, but true. I'd grown the beard during my voyage to the South Pole, and I'd kept it after returning home, and it helped, along with therapy and meditation, and a few other things, to quell my nerves. I couldn't explain it though I did find articles describing the phenomenon. Maybe it was Freudian, beard as security blanket. Maybe it was Junjun, beard as mask. Whatever, it made me calmer, and I wanted to feel as calm as possible on the day of my wedding. 
Also, my wife-to-be had never seen me without it. She loved my beard. She loved to grab it and pull me in for a kiss. I didn't want her coming down the aisle and seeing a total stranger. I explained all this to Granny, and she said she understood. Plus, her own husband liked to rock a bit of scruff now and then. Yes, she said, you may keep your beard. But then I explained it to my brother, and he bristled. Not the dumb thing, he said. Military, rules, so forth. I gave him a quick history lesson. I mentioned the many royals who'd been bearded and uniformed. King Edward V.I. King George V. Prince Albert. More recently, Prince Michael of Kent. Helpfully, I referred him to Google Images. Not the same, he said. When I informed him that his opinion didn't really matter, since I'd already gone to Granny and got the green light, he became livid. He raised his voice. You went to ask her? Yes. And what did Granny say? She said keep the beard. You put her in an uncomfortable position, Harold. She had no choice but to say yes. No choice? She's the queen. If she didn't want me to have a beard, I think she can speak for herself. But Willie always thought Granny had a soft spot for me, that she indulged me while holding him to an impossibly high standard. Because, air, spare, etc., it irked him. The argument went on, in person, on the phone, for more than a week. He wouldn't let it go. At one point he actually ordered me, as the hair speaking to the spare, to shave. Are you serious? I'm telling you, shave it off. For the love of God, Willie, why does this matter so much to you? Because I wasn't allowed to keep my beard. Ah, there it was. After he'd come back from an assignment with special forces, Willie was sporting a full beard, and someone told him to be a good boy, run along and shave it. He hated the idea of me enjoying a perk he'd been denied. It also, I suspected, brought back bad memories of being told he couldn't marry in the uniform of his choice. Then he confirmed my suspicion. He said it outright. In one of our beard debates, he complained bitterly about my being allowed to marry in my household cavalry frock coat, which he'd wanted to wear for his wedding. He was being ridiculous, and I told him so. But he kept getting angrier and angrier. Finally, I told him flatly and defiantly that his bearded brother was getting married soon, and he could either get on board or not. The choice was up to him. I showed up to my stag ready to party. To laugh, to have a good time, to get clear of all this stress. And yet I also feared that if I got too clear, got too drunk and passed out, Willie and his mates would hold me down and shave me. In fact, Willie told me, explicitly, in all seriousness, that this was his plan. So, while having fun, I was also at all times keeping my older brother in my sight. The stag was at a friend's house in the Hampshire countryside. Not on the south coast, or in Canada, or in Africa, all of which were reported as its location. Aside from my older brother, fifteen mates were in attendance. The host kitted out his indoor tennis court with various boy toys. Giant boxing gloves. Bows and arrows, a la Lord of the Rings. A mechanical bull. We painted our faces and roughhoused like idiots. Great fun. After an hour or two I was tired, and relieved when someone shouted that lunch was ready. We had a big picnic in a large, airy barn, then trooped off to a makeshift shooting range. Arming that drunken lot to the teeth. Dangerous idea. But somehow no one was hurt. When everyone was bored of firing rifles, they dressed me as a giant yellow-feathered chicken and sent me downrange to shoot fireworks at me. All right, I offered to do it. Whoever comes closest wins. I flashed back to those long-ago weekends in Norfolk, dodging fireworks with Hugh and Emily's boys. I wondered if Willie did too. How had we drifted so far from the closeness of those days? Or had we? Maybe, I thought, we can still recapture it. Now the time to be married. There had been spirited arguments in the back corridors of the palace about whether or not Meg could, or should, 
Wear a veil. Not possible, some said. For a divorcee, a veil was thought to be out of the question. But the powers that be, unexpectedly, showed some flexibility on the subject. Next came the question of a terror. My aunts asked if Meg would like to wear my mother's. We were both touched. Meg then spent hours and hours with her dress designer, getting the veil to match the tara, giving it a similar scalloped edge. Shortly before the wedding, however, Granny reached out. She offered us access to her collection of tiras. She even invited us to Buckingham Palace to try them on. Do come over, I remember her saying. Extraordinary morning. We walked into Granny's private dressing room, right next to her bedroom, a space I'd never been in. Along with Granny was a jewelry expert, an eminent historian who knew the lineage of each stone in the royal collection. Also present was Granny's dresser and confidant Angela. Five tiras were arrayed on a table, and Granny directed Meg to try on each one before a full-length mirror. I stood behind watching. One was all emeralds. One was aquamarines. Each was more dazzlingly stunning than the last. Each took my breath. I wasn't the only one. Granny said to Meg quite tenderly, Tyras suit you. Meg melted. Thank you, ma'am. One of the five, however, stood out. Everyone agreed. It was beautiful, seemingly made for Meg. Granny said it would be placed in a safe directly, and she looked forward to seeing it on Meg's head come the big day. Make sure, she added, that you practice putting it on. With your hairdresser. It's tricky, and you don't want to be doing it for the first time on the wedding day. We left the palace feeling awed and loved and grateful. A week later we contacted Angela and asked her to please send us the chosen terror so we could practice putting it on. We'd done research and we'd spoken to Kate about her own experience, and we'd learned that Granny's warning was spot on. The placing of the tiara was an intricate, elaborate process. It had to be first sewn to the veil. Then Meg's hairdresser would need to fix it to a small plate in her hair. Complicated, time-consuming. We'd need at least one dress rehearsal. For some reason, however, Angela didn't respond to any of our messages. We kept trying. No response. When we finally reached her, she said the Tyra would require an orderly and a police escort to leave the palace. That sounded a bit much. But all right, I said, if that's protocol, let's find an orderly and a police officer and get the ball rolling. Time was running out. Inexplicably, she replied, can't be done. Why can't it? Her schedule was too busy. She was being obstructive, obviously, but for what reason? We couldn't even hazard a guess. I considered going to Granny, but that would probably mean sparking an all-out confrontation, and I wasn't quite sure with whom Granny would side. Also, to my mind, Angela was a troublemaker, and I didn't need her as an enemy. Above all, she was still in possession of that Tyra. She held all the cards. Though the press was mostly laying off Meg, mostly staying focused on the approaching wedding, the harm was already done. After eighteen months of trashing her, they'd riled up all the trolls, who were now crawling out of their cellars and lairs. Ever since we'd acknowledged that we were a couple, we'd been flooded with racist taunts and death threats on social media. See ya later, race traitor. But now the official threat level used by palace security to allocate personnel and guns, had reached vertiginous heights. In pre-wedding conversations with police we learned that we'd become the prize target for terrorists and extremists. I remembered General Dannett saying I was a bullet magnet, that anyone standing next to me would be unsafe. Well, I was a bullet magnet again, but standing next to me would be the person I loved most in the world. There's been some reporting about the palace deciding to instruct Meg in guerrilla warfare and survival tactics in the event of a kidnapping attempt. A best-selling book describes the day special forces came to our house, grabbed Meg, put her through several intense days of drills, pushing her into back seats and car boots, speeding away to safe houses, all of which is utter nonsense. 
Meg wasn't given one minute of training. On the contrary, the palace floated the idea of not giving her any security at all, because I was now sixth in line to the throne. How I wished reports about special forces were even partly true. How I longed to phone my mates in special forces, have them come and train Meg and retrain me. Or, better yet, pitch in, protect us. For that matter, how I wished I could send special forces to go and grab that Tara. Angela still hadn't delivered it. Meg's hairdresser had come in from France for the rehearsal, and the Tara still wasn't there. So he'd gone back. Again, we phoned Angela. Again, nothing. Finally, Angela appeared out of thin air at Kensington Palace. I met her in the audience room. She put before me a release, which I signed, and then she handed me the tiara. I thanked her, though I added that it would have made our lives so much easier to have had it sooner. Her eyes were fire. She started having a go at me. Angela, you really want to do this now? Really? Now? She fixed me with a look that made me shiver. I could read in her face a clear warning. This isn't over. Meg had spent months trying to soothe her father. There was always something new that he'd read about himself, something derogatory he'd taken to heart. His pride was constantly wounded. Every day there was another humiliating photo in the papers. Thomas Markle buying a new loo. Thomas Markle buying a six-pack. Thomas Markle with his belly hanging over his belt. We understood. Meg told him we knew how he felt. The press, the paps, they were awful. Impossible to totally ignore what's written, she acknowledged. But please do try to ignore them in person. Ignore anyone who approaches Daddy. Be on guard against anyone who pretends to be your best friend. He seemed to be listening. He started to sound as if he was in a better place mentally. Then, the Saturday before the wedding, Jason phoned us. We've got a problem. What? The Mail on Sunday is going to run a story saying that Meg's father has been working with the Paps and for money, as staged some candid photos. We immediately phoned Meg's dad, told him what was coming. We asked if it was true. Had he staged a bunch of candid photos for money? No. Meg said, We might be able to kill this story, Daddy, but if it turns out you're lying, we'll never be able to kill a false story about ourselves or our children again. So this is serious. You must tell us the truth. He swore that he'd never staged any photos, that he hadn't taken part in any such charade, that he didn't know the pap in question. Meg whispered to me, I believe him. In that case, we told him, leave Mexico right now. A whole new level of harassment is about to rain down on you, so come to Britain. Now, We'll arrange for an apartment where you can hole up safely until your flight. Air New Zealand, first class, booked and paid for by Meg. We would immediately send a car with private security to pick him up. He said he had things to do. Now Meg's face changed. Something was up. She turned to me again and sighed. He's lying. The story broke the next morning, and it was worse than we feared. There was video of Meg's father meeting the pap at an internet cafe. There was a series of farcically staged shots, including one of him reading a book about Britain as if studying for the wedding. The photos, reportedly worth a hundred thousand pounds, seemed to prove beyond all doubt that Meg's father had indeed been lying. He'd taken part in this fakery, maybe to make some money, or maybe they had some leverage on him. We didn't know. Headlines read. Meg Markle's father a con artist. Staged candid photos for money. A week before the wedding, this now became the story. Though the photos had been taken weeks before, they'd been held in reserve until the most devastating possible moment. Soon after the story broke, Thomas Markle sent us a text. I'm so ashamed. We phoned him. And texted him. And phoned again. We're not angry please pick up. He didn't answer. Then we heard, along with the rest of the world, that he'd apparently had a heart attack and wasn't coming to the wedding. 
The next day, maid had a text from Kate. There was a problem with the dresses for the bridesmaids, apparently. They needed altering. The dresses were French couture, hand sewn from measurements only. So it wasn't a big shock that they might need altering. Meg didn't reply to Kate straight away. Yes, she had endless wedding-related texts, but mostly she was dealing with the chaos surrounding her father. So the next morning she texted Kate that our tailor was standing by. At the palace. His name was Ajay. This wasn't sufficient. They set up a time to speak that afternoon. Charlotte's dress is too big, too long, too baggy. She cried when she tried it on at home, Kate said. Right, and I told you the tailor has been standing by since Atam here. At KP. Can you take Charlotte to have it altered, as the other moms are doing? No, all the dresses need to be remade. Her own wedding dress designer agreed, Kate added. Meg asked if Kate was aware of what was going on right now with her father. Kate said she was well aware of the dresses. And the wedding is in four days. Yes, Kate, I know. And Kate had other problems with the way Meg was planning her wedding. Something about a party for the page boys. The page boys. Half the kids in the wedding are from North America. They haven't even arrived yet. It went back and forth. I'm not sure what else to say. If the dress doesn't fit, then please take Charlotte to see a Jay. He's been waiting all day. Fine. A short time later I arrived home and found Meg on the floor. Sobbing. I was horrified to see her so upset, but I didn't think it a catastrophe. Emotions were running high, of course, after the stress of the last week, the last month, the last day. It was intolerable, but temporary. Kate hadn't meant any harm, I told her. Indeed, the next morning Kate came by with flowers and a card that said she was sorry. Meg's best friend, Lindsay, was in the kitchen when she turned up. Simple misunderstanding, I told myself. One the eve of the wedding, I stayed at Coworth Park Hotel. A private cottage. Several mates sat with me and had drinks. One commented that I seemed a bit distracted. Yes, well, there's been a lot going on. I didn't want to say too much. The business with Meg's father, Kate, and the dress. The constant worry about someone in the crowd doing something crazy. Better not to talk about it. Someone asked about my brother. Where's Willie? I gave another non-answer. Another sore subject. He'd been scheduled to join us for the evening. But like Meg's father, he cancelled last minute. He told me, just before he attended tea with Granny, can't do it, Harold, Kate, and the kids. I'd reminded him that this was our tradition, that we'd had dinner before his wedding, that we'd gone together and visited the crowds. He held fast. Can't do it. I pushed. Why are you being like this, Willie? I was with you the whole night before you married Kate. Why are you doing this? I asked myself what was really going on. Was he feeling bad about not being my best man? Was he upset that I'd asked my old mate Charlie? The palace put out the story that Willie was the best man, as they'd done with me when he and Kate married. Could that be part of it? Or was it a hangover from Birdate? Or was he feeling guilty about the business between Kate and Meg? He wasn't giving any indication. He just kept saying no while asking me why it even mattered so much. Why are you even saying hello to the crowds, Harold? Because the press office told me to. As we did at your wedding. You don't need to listen to them. Since bloody when? I felt sick about it. I'd always believed, despite our problems, that our underlying bond was strong. I'd thought brotherhood would always trump a bridesmaid's dress or a beard. Suppose not. Then, just after leaving Granny, around 6 p.m., Willie texted. He'd changed his mind. He'd come. Maybe Granny intervened. Whatever. I thanked him happily, heartily. Moments later, we met outside and got into a car, which drove us down to King Edward Gate. We hopped out, 
walked up and down the crowd, thanking people for coming. People wished us well, blew us kisses. We waved goodbye, got back into the car. As we drove off, I asked him to come have dinner with me. I mentioned maybe staying the night, as I'd done before his wedding. He'd come for dinner, he said, but wouldn't be able to stay. Come on, please, Willie. Sorry, Harold. Count. Kids. I stood at the altar smoothed the front of my household cavalry uniform, watched Meg floating towards me. I'd worked hard to choose the right music for her procession, and ultimately I'd landed on Handel's eternal source of light divine. Now, as the soloist's voice rang out above our heads, I thought I'd chosen well. Indeed, as Meg came nearer and nearer, I was giving thanks for all my choices. Amazing that I could even hear the music over the sound of my own heartbeat as Meg stepped up, took my hand. The present dissolved, the past came rushing back. Our first tentative messages on Instagram. Our first meeting at Soho House. Our first trip to Botswana. Our first excited exchanges after my phone went into the river. Our first roast chicken. Our first flights back and forth across the Atlantic. The first time I told her, I'd love you. Hearing her say it back. Guy in splints. Steve the grumpy swan. The brutal fight to keep her safe from the press. And now here we were, the finishing line. The starting line. For the last few months, not much had gone according to plan. But I reminded myself that none of that was the plan. This was the plan. This? Love. I shot a glance at Pa, who'd walked Meg down the last part of the aisle. Not her father, but special just the same, and she was moved. It didn't make up for her father's behavior, for how the press had used him, but it very much helped. Aunt Jane stood and gave a reading in honor of Mummy, Psalm of Solomon. Meg, and I chose it. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For love is strong as death, passion fierce as the grave. Strong as death, fierce as the grave. Yes, I thought. Yes. I saw the archbishop extend the rings, his hands shaking. I'd forgotten, but he clearly hadn't. Twelve cameras pointed at us, two billion people watching on TV, photographers in the rafters, Massive crowds outside roistering and cheering. We exchanged the rings, Meg's made from the same hunk of Welsh gold that had provided Kate's. Granny had told me that this was nearly the last of it. Last of the gold, that was how I felt about Meg. The Archbishop reached the official part, spoke the few words that made us the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, titles bestowed by Granny, and he joined us until death parted us, Though he'd already done similar days earlier, in our garden, a small ceremony, just the two of us, Guy and Pula, the only witnesses. Unofficial, non-binding, except in our souls. We were grateful for every person in and around Saint. George's and watching on TV, but our love began in private, and being public had been mostly pain, so we wanted the first consecration of our love, the first vows, to be private as well. Magical as the formal ceremony was, we'd both come to feel slightly frightened of crowds. Underscoring this feeling, the first thing we saw upon walking back up the aisle and out of the church, other than a stream of smiling faces, was snipers. On the rooftops, amid the bunting, behind the waterfalls of streamers, police told me it was unusual but necessary. Due to the unprecedented number of threats they were picking up, our honeymoon was a closely guarded secret. We left London in a car disguised as a removals van, the windows covered with cardboard, and went to the Mediterranean for ten days. Glorious to be away, on the sea, in the sun. But we were also sick. The build-up to the wedding had worn us down. We returned just in time for the official June celebration of Granny's birthday. Trooping the Colour one of our first public appearances as newlyweds. Everyone present was in a good mood, upbeat. But then, 
Kate asked Meg what she thought of her first trooping the color. And Meg joked, colorful. And a yawning silence threatened to swallow us all whole. Days later Meg went off on her first royal trip with Granny. She was nervous, but they got on famously. They also bonded over their love of dogs. She returned from the trip glowing. We bonded, she told me. The Queen and I really bonded. We talked about how much I wanted to be a mom, and she told me the best way to induce labor was a good bumpy car ride. I told her I'd remember that when the time came. Things are going to turn around now, we both said. The papers, however, pronounced the trip an unmitigated disaster. They portrayed Meg as pushy, uppity, ignorant of royal protocol, because she'd made the unthinkable mistake of getting into a car before Granny. In truth, she'd done exactly what Granny had told her to do. Granny said get in. She got in. No matter. There were stories for days about Meg's breach, about her overall lack of class, about her daring not to wear a hat in Granny's presence. The palace had specifically directed Meg not to wear a hat. Granny also wore green to honor the victims of Grenfell Tower, and no one told Meg to wear green. So that he said she didn't give a fig about the victims. I said, the palace will make a phone call. They'll correct the record. They didn't. Willie and Kate invited us for tea. To clear the air. June 2018. We walked over one late afternoon. I saw Meg's eyes widen as we entered their front door, walked past their front sitting room, down their hallway, into their study. Wow, Meg said several times. The wallpaper, the crown molding, the walnut bookshelves lined with color-coordinated volumes, the priceless art. Gorgeous, like a museum, and we both told them so. We complimented them lavishly on their renovation, though we also thought sheepishly of our IKEA lamps. Our discount sofa recently bought on sale, with Meg's credit card, from sofa.com. In the study, Meg, and I sat on a love seat at one end of the room, Kate opposite us on a leather-clad fender before the fireplace. Willie was to her left, in an armchair. There was a tray of tea and biscuits. For ten minutes we did the classic small talk. How are the kids? How was your honeymoon? Meg then acknowledged the tension among the four of us and ventured that it might go back to those early days when she'd first joined the family, a misunderstanding that had almost passed without notice. Kate thought Meg had wanted her fashion contacts, but Meg had her own. They'd got off on the wrong foot, perhaps. And then Meg added, everything got magnified by the wedding and those infernal bridesmaids' dresses. But it turned out there were other things about which we'd been unaware. Willie and Kate were apparently upset that we hadn't given them Easter presents. Easter presents. Was that a thing? Willie and I had never exchanged Easter presents. Pa always made a big deal about Easter, sure, but that was pay. Still, if Willie and Kate were upset, we apologized. For our part, we chipped in that we weren't too pleased when Willie and Kate switched place cards and changed seats at our wedding. We'd followed the American tradition, placing couples next to each other, but Willie and Kate didn't like that tradition, so their table was the only one where spouses were apart. They insisted it wasn't them, it was someone else. And they said we'd done the same thing at Pippa's wedding. We hadn't, much as we'd wanted to. We'd been separated by a huge flower arrangement between us, and though we desperately wanted to sit together, we hadn't done a thing about it. None of this airing of grievances was doing us any good, I felt. We weren't getting anywhere. Kate looked out into the garden, gripping the edges of the leather so tightly that her fingers were white, and said she was owed an apology. Meg asked, For what? You hurt my feelings, Megan. When? Please tell me. I told you I couldn't remember something and you said it was my hormones. What are you talking about? Kate mentioned a phone call in which they discussed the timing of wedding rehearsals. Meg said, Oh, yes. I remember. You couldn't remember something. And I said it's not a big deal. It's baby brain. 
because you just had a baby. It's hormones. Kate's eyes widened. Yes. You talked about my hormones. We're not close enough for you to talk about my hormones. Meg's eyes got white too. She looked genuinely confused. I'm sorry I talked about your hormones. That's just how I talk with my girlfriends. Willie pointed at Meg. It's rude, Megan. It's not what's done here in Britain. Kindly take your finger out of my face. Was this really happening? Had it actually come to this? Shouting at each other about place cards and hormones. Meg said she'd never intentionally do anything to hurt Kate. And if she ever did, she asked Kate to please just let her know so it wouldn't happen again. We all hugged. Kind of. And then I said we'd better be going. Our staff sensed that friction, raved the press, and thus there was frequent bickering around the office. Sides were taken. Team Cambridge versus Team Sussex. Rivalry, jealousy, competing agendas. It all poisoned the atmosphere. It didn't help that everyone was working around the clock. There were so many demands from the press, such a constant stream of errors that needed clearing up, and we didn't have nearly enough people or resources. At best, we were able to address 10% of what was out there. Nerves were shattering. People were sniping. In such a climate, there was no such thing as constructive criticism. All feedback was seen as an affront, an insult. More than once a staff member slumped across their desk and wept. For all this, every bit of it, Willie blamed one person. Meg. He told me so several times and he got cross when I told him he was out of line. He was just repeating the press narrative, spouting fake stories he'd read or been told. The great irony, I told him, was that the real villains were the people he'd imported into the office, people from government who didn't seem impervious to this kind of strife, but addicted to it. They had a knack for backstabbing, a talent for intrigue, and they were constantly setting our two groups of staff against each other. Meanwhile, in the midst of all this, Meg managed to remain calm. Despite what certain people were saying about her, I never heard her speak a bad word about anybody or to anybody. On the contrary, I watched her redouble her efforts to reach out, to spread kindness. She sent out handwritten thank you notes, checked on staff who were ill, sent baskets of food or flowers or goodies to anyone struggling, depressed, off sick. The office was often dark and cold, so she warmed it up with new lamps and space heaters, all bought with her personal credit card. She brought pizza and biscuits, hosted tea parties and ice cream socials. She shared all the freebies she received, clothes and perfumes and makeup, with all the women in the office. I stood back in awe at her ability or determination to always see the good in people. The size of her heart was really brought home for me one day. I learned that Mr. R, my former upstairs neighbor when I was in the badger set, had suffered a tragedy. His adult son had died. Meg didn't know Mr. R, neither did she know the son. But she knew the family had been my neighbors, and she'd often seen them walking their dogs. So she felt tremendous sorrow for them, and wrote the father a letter, expressing condolences telling him she wanted to give him a hug, but didn't know if it would be appropriate. With the letter she included of Virginia, to plant in the son's memory. A week later Mr. R appeared at our front door at Not Cot. He handed Meg a thank you note and gave her a tight hug. I felt so proud of her, so regretful about my feud with Mr. R. More, I felt regretful about my family feuding with my wife. We didn't want to wait. We both wanted to start a family straight away. We were working crazy hours, our jobs were demanding, the timing wasn't ideal, but too bad. This had always been our main priority. We worried about the stress of our daily lives, that it might prevent us getting pregnant. The toll was starting to be visible on Meg. She'd lost a great deal of weight in the last year, despite all the shepherd's pie. I'm eating more than ever, she reported. Yet her weight kept dropping. Friends recommended an Ayurvedic doctor who'd helped them conceive. As I understood it, 
Ayurvedic medicine sorted people into categories. I don't recall which category this doctor sorted Meg into, but she did confirm our suspicion that Meg's weight loss might be a barrier to conceiving. Gain five pounds, the doctor promised, and you'll get pregnant. So Meg ate and ate and soon put on the recommended five pounds, and we looked hopefully at the calendar. Towards the end of summer 2018 we went to Scotland, the castle of May, to spend a few days with Pe. The bond between Meg and Pa, always strong, grew even stronger during that weekend. One night, over pre-dinner cocktails, Fred Astaire playing in the background, it emerged that Meg shared a birth date with Pa's favorite person. Gan Gan. August 4. Amazing, Pa said with a smile. At the memory of Gan Gan and the link between her and my bride, he suddenly became buoyant, telling stories I'd never heard, essentially performing, showing off for Meg. One story in particular delighted us both, captured our imagination. It was about the Selkies. The what? Pay. Scottish mermaids, he said. They took the form of seals and cruised along the shore outside the castle within a stone's throw of where we were sitting. So, when you see a seal, he advised, you never can tell. Sing to it. They often sing back. Oh, come on. You're telling fairy tales, pa. No, it's absolutely true. Did I imagine, did pa promise, that the Selkies might also grant a wish? We talked a bit during that dinner about the stress we'd been under. If we could just convince the papers to back off. We said, for a little while. Pei nodded, but he felt it very important to remind us. Yes, yes, Pei. We know. Don't read it. At tea, the next day, the good vibes continued. We were all laughing, talking about one thing and another, when Pa's butler burst into the room, pulling a landline behind him. Your Royal Highness, Her Majesty. Pa sat bolt upright. Oh, yes. He reached for the phone. I'm sorry, sir, but she's calling for the Duchess. Oh. We all looked stunned. Meg tentatively reached for the phone. It seemed Granny was calling to talk about Meg's father. She was responding to a letter Meg had written her, asking for advice and help. Meg said she didn't know how to make the press stop interviewing him, enticing him to say horrid things. Granny now suggested that Meg forget the press, go and see her father, try to talk some sense into him. Meg explained that he lived in a Mexican border town, and she didn't know how she'd ever get through the airport, through the press surrounding his house, then through that part of town, and back again, quietly, safely. Granny acknowledged the many problems with this plan. In that case, perhaps write him a letter. Pa agreed. Splendid idea. Meg. And I went down to the beach in front of the castle. Chilly day, but the sun was bright. We stood on the rocks, looking out at the sea. Amid all the silky islands of seaweed we saw. Something. Ahead. A pair of soulful eyes. Look. Seal. The head bobbed up and down. The eyes very clearly watched us. Look. Another. Just as Pei instructed, I ran to the water's edge, sound to them, serenaded them. Aru. No answer. Meg joined me and sound to them, and now of course they sang back. She really is magic, I thought. Even the seals know it. Suddenly, all over the water, heads were bobbing up, singing to her. Aru. A seal opera. Silly superstition, maybe, but I didn't care. I counted it a good omen. I took off my clothes, jumped into the water, swam to them. Later, Pa's arsy chef was horrified. He told us that this had been a supremely bad idea, more ill-advised than diving heedless into the darkest water of the Okavango. This part of the Scottish coast was teeming with killer whales, the chef said and singing to seals was like calling them to their blood-soaked deaths. I shook my head. It had been such a lovely fairy tale, I thought. How did it get so dark so fast? 
Meg was late. We bought two home pregnancy tests, one for a backup, and she took them both into the bathroom at Not Cot. I was lying on our bed, and while waiting for her to come out, I fell asleep. When I woke, she was beside me. What's happened? Is it? She said she hadn't looked. She'd waited for me. The wands were on the nightstand. I only kept a few things there, among them the blue box with my mother's hair. Right, I thought, good. Let's see what Mummy can do with this situation. I reached for the wands, peered into their little windows. Blue, bright, bright blue. Both of them. Blue meant baby. Oh, wow. Well, well then, we hugged, kissed. I put the wands back on the nightstand. I thought, thank you, Selkies. I thought, thank you, Mummy. Huge was getting married to Jack, and we were deliriously happy for her, and for ourselves, selfishly, since Jack was one of our favorite people. Meg and I were supposed to head off on our first official foreign tour as a married couple, but we delayed the departure several days so we could be at the wedding. Also, the various gatherings connected to the wedding would give us a chance to pull aside family members one by one and tell them our good news. At Windsor, just before a drinks reception for the bride and groom, we cornered Pa in his study. He was sitting behind his big desk, which afforded his favorite view straight down the long walk. Every window was open to cool the room, and a breeze was fluttering his papers, which were all stacked in squat little towers each crowned with a paperweight. He was delighted to learn that he was going to be a grandfather for a fourth time. His wide smile warmed me. After the drinks reception in St. George's Hall, Meg and I pulled Willie aside. We were in a big room, suits of armor on the walls. Strange room, strange moment. We whispered the news, and Willie smiled and said we must tell Kate. She was across the room, talking to Pippa. I said we could do it later, but he insisted. So we went and told Kate, and she also gave a big smile and hearty congratulations. They both reacted exactly as I'd hoped, as I'd wished days later the pregnancy was announced publicly. The papers reported that Meg was battling fatigue and dizzy spells and couldn't hold any food down, especially in the mornings, all of which was untrue. She was tired, but otherwise a dynamo. Indeed. She felt lucky not to be suffering severe morning sickness, since we were embarking on a hugely demanding tour. Everywhere we went, enormous crowds turned out, and she didn't disappoint them. All across Australia, Tonga, Fiji, New Zealand, she dazzled. After one especially rousing speech, she got a standing ovation. She was so brilliant that midway through the tour I felt compelled to warn her. You're doing too well my love. Too damn well. You're making it look too easy. This is how everything started. With my mother. Maybe I sounded mad, paranoid. But everyone knew that mummy's situation went from bad to worse when she showed the world, showed the family, that she was better at touring, better at connecting with people, better at being royal, than she had any right to be. That was when things really took a turn. We returned home to jubilant welcomes and exultant headlines. Meg, the expectant mother, the flawless representative of the crown, was hailed. Not a negative word was written. It's changed, we said. It's changed at last. But then it changed again. Oh, how it changed. Stories rolled in, like breakers on a beach. First a rubbish hit piece by a hack biographer of Per who said I'd thrown a tantrum before the wedding. Then a work of fiction about Meg making her staff miserable, driving them too hard, committing the unpardonable sin of emailing people early in the morning. She just happened to be up at that hour, trying to stay in touch with night ill friends back in America. She didn't expect an instant reply. She was also said to have driven our assistant to quit. In fact, that assistant was asked to resign by Palace HR after we showed them evidence she'd traded on her position with Meg to get freebies. But because we couldn't speak publicly about the reasons for the assistant's departure, 
rumors filled the void. In many ways that was the true start of all the troubles. Shortly thereafter, the Duchess' difficult narrative began appearing in all the papers. Next came a novella in one of the tabloids about the terror. The article said Meg had demanded a certain terror that had belonged to Mummy, and when the Queen refused, I'd thrown a fit. What Megan wants, Megan gets. Days later came the coup de grace. From a royal correspondent, a sci-fi fantasy describing the growing Freuder. Good Lord, between Kate and Meg, claiming that, according to two sources, Meg had reduced Kate to tears about the bridesmaid's dresses. This particular royal correspondent had always made me ill. She'd always, always got stuff wrong. But this felt more than wrong. I read the story in disbelief. Meg didn't. She still wasn't reading anything. She heard about it, however, since it was the only thing being discussed in Britain for the next 24 hours. And as long as I live, I'll never forget the tone of her voice as she looked me in the eye and said, Has! I made her cry. I made her cry. We arranged a second summit with Willie and Kate. This time on our turf. December 10, 2018. Early evening. We all gathered in our little front annex. And this time there was no small talk. Kate got things rolling straight away by acknowledging that these stories in the papers about Meg making her cry were totally false. I know, Megan, that I was the one who made you cry. I sighed. Excellent start, I thought. Meg appreciated the apology, but wanted to know why the papers had said this, and what was being done to correct them. In other words, why isn't your office standing up for me? Why haven't they phoned this execrable woman who wrote this story and demanded a retraction? Kate, flustered, didn't answer, and Willie chimed in with some very supportive sounding evasions, but I already knew the truth. No one at the palace could phone the correspondent, because that would invite the inevitable retort. Well, if the story's wrong, what's the real story? What did happen between the two duchesses? And that door must never be opened, because it would embarrass the future queen. The monarchy, always, at all costs, had to be protected. We shifted from what to do about the story to where it came from. Who could have planted such a thing? Who could have leaked it to the press in the first place? Who? We went around and around. The list of suspects became vanishingly small. Finally, finally, Willie beamed back and conceded that, ahem, while we'd be on tour in Australia, he and Kate had gone to dinner with Pe and Camilla. And alas, he said sheepishly, he might have let it slip that there'd been strife between the two couples. I put a hand over my face. Meg froze. A heavy silence fell. So now we knew. I told Willie. You, of all people, should have known. He nodded. He knew. More silence. It was time for them to go. It kept on and on one story after another. I thought at times of Mr. Marston ceaselessly ringing his insane bell. Who can ever forget the spate of front-page stories making Meg out to be single-handedly responsible for the end times? Specifically, she'd been caught eating avocado toast, and many stories explained breathlessly that the harvesting of avocados was hastening the destruction of the rainforests, destabilizing developing countries and helping to fund state terrorism. Of course, the same media had recently swooned over Kate's love of avocados. Oh, how they make Kate's skin glow. Notably, it was around this time that the super-narrative embedded within each story began to shift. It was no longer about two women fighting, two duchesses at odds, or even two households. It was now about one person being a witch and causing everyone to run from her and that one person was my wife. And in building this super-narrative the press was clearly being assisted by someone or multiple summons inside the palace. Someone who had it in for Meg. One day it was. Yuck! Meg's brace strap was showing. Castless Megan. The next day. Yikes! She's wearing that dress? Trashy Megan. The next day. God save us! Her fingernails are painted black. Goth Megan. 
The next day, goodness, she still doesn't know how to curtsy properly. American Megan. The next day, Prakey, she shut her own car door again. Uppity Megan. We'd rented a house in Oxfordshire. Just a place to get away now and then from the maelstrom, but also from Notcot, which was charming but too small, and falling down around our heads. It got so bad that one day I had to phone Granny. I told her we needed a new place to live. I explained that Willie and Kate hadn't simply outgrown Notcot. They'd fled it because of all the required repairs and the lack of room, and we were now in the same boat. With two rambunctious dogs and a baby on the way. I told her we'd discussed our housing situation with the palace, and we'd been offered several properties, but each was too grand, we thought. Too lavish, and too expensive to renovate. Granny gave it a think, and we chatted again days later. Frogmore, she said. Frogmore, Granny? Yes, Frogmore. Frogmore House? I knew it well. That was where we'd taken our engagement photos. No, no, Frogmore Cottage. Near Frogmore House. Sort of hidden, she said. Tucked away. Originally home to Queen Charlotte and her daughters, then to one of Queen Victoria's aides, and later it was chopped into smaller units. But it could be reassembled. Lovely place, Granny said. Plus, historic. Part of the Crone Estate. Very sweet. I told her that Meg and I loved the gardens at Frogmore. We went walking there often. And if it was near those, well, what could be better? She warned. It's a bit of a building site. Bit of a shell. But go and have a look and do tell me if it works. We went that day, and Granny was right. The house spoke to us both. Charming, full of potential. Hard by the royal burial ground, but so what? Didn't bother me or Meg. We wouldn't disturb the dead if they'd promise not to disturb us. I rang Granny and said Frogmore Cottage would be a dream come true. I thanked her profusely. With her permission we began sitting down with builders, planning the minimum renovations to make the place habitable. Piping, heating, water. While the work was being done, we thought we could move into Oxfordshire full-time. We loved it out there. The air fresh, the verdant grounds, plus, no paps. Best of all, we'd be able to call upon the talents of my father's long-time butler, Kevin. He knew the Oxfordshire house, and he'd know how to turn it quickly into a home. Better yet, he knew me, held me as a baby, and befriended my mother when she was wandering Windsor Castle in search of a sympathetic face. He told me that Mummy was the only person in the family who ever dared venture below stairs to chat with staff. In fact, she'd often sneak down and sit with Kevin in the kitchen, over a drink or snack, watching telly. It had fallen to Kevin, on the day of Mummy's funeral, to greet me and Willie on our return to Highgrove. He stood on the front steps, he recalled, waiting for our car, rehearsing what he'd say. But when we pulled up, and he opened the car door, I said. How are you holding up, Kevin? So polite, he said. So repressed, I thought. Meg adored Kevin, and vice versa, so I thought this could be the start of something good. A much-needed change of scenery, a much-needed ally in our corner. Then one day I looked down at my phone, a text from our team alerting me to huge splashy stories in the Sun and the Daily Mail featuring detailed overhead photos of Oxfordshire. A helicopter was hovering above the property, a pap hanging out of the door, aiming telephoto lenses at every window, including our bedroom. Thus ended the dream of Oxfordshire. I walked home from the office and found Meg sitting on the stairs. She was sobbing. Uncontrollably. My love, what's happened? I thought for sure we'd lost the baby. I went to her on my knees. She choked out that she didn't want to do this anymore. Do what? Life? I didn't catch her meaning at first. I didn't understand, maybe didn't want to understand. My mind just didn't want to process the words. It's all so painful, she was saying. What is? 
to be hated like this, for what? What had she done? She asked. She really wanted to know. What sin had she committed to deserve this kind of treatment? She just wanted to make the pain stop, she said. Not only for her, for everyone. For me, for her mother. But she couldn't make it stop, so she decided to disappear. Disappear. Without her, she said. All the press would go away, and then I wouldn't have to live like this. Our unborn child would never have to live like this. It's so clear, she kept saying, it's so clear. Just stop breathing. Stop being. This exists because I exist. I begged her not to talk like that. I promised her we'd get through it, we'd find a way. In the meantime, we'd find her the help she needed. I asked her to be strong. Hang on. Incredibly, while reassuring her and hugging her, I couldn't entirely stop thinking like a fucking royal. We had a centibale engagement that night at the Royal Albert Hall, and I kept telling myself, We can't be late. We cannot be late. They'll skin us alive. And they'll blame her. Slowly, too slowly, I realized that tardiness was the least of our problems. I said she should skip the engagement, of course. I needed to go, make a quick appearance, but I'd be home fast. No, she insisted. She didn't trust herself to be at home alone for even an hour with such dark feelings. So we put on our best kit, and she applied dark, dark lipstick to draw attention away from her bloodshot eyes, and out of the door we went. The car pulled up outside the Royal Albert Hall and as we stepped into the blue flashing lights of the police escort and the white-out lights of the press's flashbulbs, Meg reached for my hand. She gripped it tightly. As we went inside, she gripped it even tighter. I was buoyed by the tightness of that grip. She's hanging on, I thought. Better than letting go. But when we settled into the royal box and the lights dimmed, she let go of her emotions. She couldn't hold back the tears. She wept silently. The music struck up. We turned and faced the front. We spent the entire length of the performance. Cirque du Soleil, squeezing each other's hands. Me promising her in a whisper. Trust me. I'll keep you safe. I woke to a text from Jason. Bad news. What is it now? The mail on Sunday had printed the private letter Meg had written to her father. The letter that Granny and Pei urged her to write. February 2019 I was in bed. Meg was lying next to me, still asleep. I waited a bit, then broke the news to her softly. Your father's given your letter to the mail. No. Meg, I don't know what to say. He's given them your letter. That moment for me was decisive. About Mr. Markle, but also about the press. There had been so many moments, but that for me was the one. I didn't want to hear any more talk of protocols, tradition, strategy. Enough, I thought. Enough. The paper knew it was illegal to publish that letter, they knew full well, and did it anyway. Why? Because they also knew Meg was defenseless. They knew she didn't have the staunch support of my family. And how else could they have known this, except from people close to the family? Or inside the family? The papers knew that the only recourse Meg had was to sue, and she couldn't do that because there was only one lawyer working with the family, and that lawyer was under the control of the palace, and the palace would never authorize him to act on Meg's behalf. There was nothing in that letter to be ashamed about. A daughter pleading with her father to behave decently. Meg stood by every word. She'd always known it might be intercepted that one of her father's neighbors, or one of the paps staking out his house, might steal his post. Anything was possible. But she never stopped to think her father would actually offer it, or that a paper would actually take it, and print it, and edit it. Indeed, that might have been the most gulling thing, the way the editors cut and pasted Meg's words to make them sound less loving. Seeing something so deeply personal smeared across the front pages, gobbled up by Britons over their morning toast and marmalade, was invasive enough. 
but the pain was compounded tenfold by the simultaneous interviews with alleged handwriting experts, who analyzed Meg's letter and inferred from the way she crossed her T's or curved her R's that she was a terrible person. Rightward slant, over-emotional, highly stylized, consummate performer, uneven baseline, no impulse control. The look on Meg's face as I told her about these libels rolling out. I knew my way around grief, and there was no mistaking it. This was pure grief. She was mourning the loss of her father, and she was also mourning the loss of her own innocence. She reminded me in a whisper, as if someone might be listening, that she'd taken a handwriting class in high school, and as a result she'd always had excellent penmanship. People complimented her. She'd even used this skill at university to earn spare money. Nights, weekends, she'd inscribed wedding and birthday party invitations to pay the rent. Now people were trying to say that this was some kind of window into her soul, and the window was dirty. Tormenting Meghan Markle has become a national sport that shames us, said a headline in The Guardian. So true, but no one was shamed, that was the problem. No one was feeling the slightest pang of conscience. Would they finally feel some if they caused a divorce? Or would it take another death? What had become of all the shame they'd felt in the late 1990s? Meg wanted to sue. Me too. Rather, we both felt we had no choice. If we didn't sue over this, we said, what kind of signal would that be sending? To the press? To the world? So we conferred again with a palace lawyer. We were given a runaround. I reached out to Pei and Willie. They'd both sued the press in the past over invasions and lies. Pa sued over so-called black spider letters, his memos to government officials. Willie sued over topless photos of Kate. But both vehemently opposed the idea of Meg and me taking any legal action. Why? I asked. They hummed and hayed. The only answer I could get out of them was that it simply wasn't advisable. The done thing, etc. I told Meg, you think we were suing a dear friend of theirs. Willie asked for a meeting. He wanted to talk about everything, the whole rolling catastrophe. Just him and me, he said. As it happened, Meg was out of town, visiting girlfriends, so his timing was perfect. I invited him over. An hour later he walked into Notcot, where he hadn't been since Meg first moved in. He looked piping hot. It was early evening. I offered him a drink, asked about his family. Everyone good. He didn't ask about mine. He just went all in. Chips to the center of the table. Meg's difficult, he said. Oh, really? She's rude. She's abrasive. She's alienated half the staff. Not the first time he perroted the press narrative. Duchess difficult, all that bullshit. Rumors, lies from his team, tabloid rubbish, and I told him so. Again. Told him I expected better from my older brother. I was shocked to see that this actually pissed him off. Had he come here expecting something different? Did he think I'd agree that my bride was a monster? I told him to step back, take a breath, really ask himself. Wasn't Meg his sister-in-law? Wouldn't this institution be toxic for any newcomer? Worst case scenario, if his sister-in-law was having trouble adjusting to a new office, a new family, a new country, a new culture, couldn't he see his way clear to cutting her some slack? Couldn't you just be there for her? Help her? He had no interest in a debate. He'd come to lay down the law. He wanted me to agree that Meg was wrong, and then agree to do something about it. Like what? Scold her? Fire her? Divorce her? I didn't know. But Willie didn't know either. He wasn't rational. Every time I tried to slow him down, point out the illogic of what he was saying, he got louder. We were soon talking over each other, both of us shouting. Among all the different riotous emotions coursing through my brother that afternoon, one really jumped out at me. He seemed aggrieved. He seemed put upon that I wasn't meekly obeying him, 
that I was being so impertinent as to deny him or defy him, to refute his knowledge which came from his trusted aids. There was a script here, and I had the audacity not to be following it. He was in full hair mode, and couldn't fathom why I wasn't dutifully playing the role of the spare. I was sitting on the sofa, he was standing over me. I remember saying, You need to hear me out, Willie. He wouldn't. He simply would not listen. To be fair, he felt the same about me. He called me names. All kinds of names. He said I refused to take responsibility for what was happening. He said I didn't care about my office and the people who worked for me. Willie, give me one example of. He cut me off, said he was trying to help me. Are you serious? Help me. Sorry, is that what you call this? Helping me. For some reason that really set him off. He stepped towards me, swearing. To that point I'd been feeling uncomfortable, but now I felt a bit scared. I stood, brushed past him, went out to the kitchen, to the sink. He was right on my heels, berating me, shouting. I poured a glass of water for myself, and one for him as well. I handed it to him. I don't think he took a sip. Willie, I can't speak to you when you're like this. He set down the water, called me another name, then came at me. It all happened so fast. So very fast. He grabbed me by the collar, ripping my necklace, and he knocked me to the floor. I landed on the dog's bowl, which cracked under my back, the pieces cutting into me. I lay there for a moment, dazed, then got to my feet and told him to get out. Come on, hit me. You'll feel better if you hit me. Do what? Come on, we always used to fight. You'll feel better if you hit me. No, only you'll feel better if I hit you. Please, just leave. He left the kitchen, but he didn't leave not caught. He was in the sitting room, I could tell. I stayed in the kitchen. Two minutes passed, two long minutes. He came back looking regretful and apologized. He walked to the front door. This time I followed. Before leaving he turned and called back. You don't need to tell Meg about this. You mean that you attacked me? I didn't attack you, Harold. Fine. I won't tell her. Good. Thank you. He left. I looked at the phone. A promise is a promise, I told myself, so I couldn't call my wife, much as I wanted to. But I needed to talk to someone, so I rang my therapist. Thank God she answered. I apologized for the intrusion, told her I didn't know who else to call. I told her I'd had a fight with Willie, he'd knocked me to the floor. I looked down and told her that my shirt was ripped, my necklace was broken. We'd had a million physical fights in our lives, I told her. As boys we'd done nothing but fight. But this felt different. The therapist told me to take deep breaths. She asked me to describe the scene several times. Each time I did it seemed more like a bad dream. And made me a bit calmer. I told her, I'm proud of myself. Proud, Harry? Why is that? I didn't hit him back. I stayed true to my word, didn't tell Meg. But not long after she returned from her trip, she saw me coming out of the shower and gasped. Has, what are those scrapes and bruises on your back? I couldn't lie to her. She wasn't that surprised, and she wasn't at all angry. She was terribly sad. Soon after that day it was announced that the two royal households, Cambridge and Sussex, would no longer share an office. We'd no longer be working together in any capacity. The Fab Four, Finis. Reaction was about as expected. The public groaned, journalists brayed. The more disheartening response was from my family. Silence. They'd never commented publicly, never said anything privately to me. I never heard from Pa, never heard from Granny. It made me think, really think about the silence that surrounded everything else that happened to me and Meg. I'd always told myself that, just because everyone in my family didn't explicitly condemn press attacks, it didn't mean they condemned them. 
But now I asked, is that true? How do I know? If they never say anything, why do I so often assume that I know how they feel and that they're unequivocally on our side? Everything I'd been taught, everything I'd grown up believing about the family and about the monarchy, about its essential fairness, its job of uniting rather than dividing, was being undermined, called into question. Was it all fake? Was it all just a show? Because if we couldn't stand up for one another, rally around our newest member, our first biracial member, then what were we really? Was that a true constitutional monarchy? Was that a real family? Isn't defending each other the first rule of every family? Meg and I moved our office into Buckingham Palace. We also moved into a new home. Frogmore was ready. We loved that place. From the first minute, it felt as if we were destined to live there. We couldn't wait to wake up in the morning, go for a long walk in the gardens, check in with the swans. Especially Grumpy Steve. We met the Queen's gardeners, got to know their names and the names of all the flowers. They thrilled at how much we appreciated and praised their artistry. Amid all this change we huddled with our new head of con, Sarah. We plotted a new strategy with her, the centerpiece of which was having nothing whatsoever to do with the royal rota, and hoped we might soon be able to make a fresh start. Towards the end of April 2019, days before Meg was due to give birth, Willie rang. I took the call in our new garden. Something had happened between him and Pei and Camilla. I couldn't get the whole story, he was talking too fast, and was way too upset. He was seething, actually. I gathered that Pei and Camilla's people had planted a story or stories about him and Kate and the kids, and he wasn't going to take it anymore. Give Pa and Camilla an inch, he said. They take a mile. They've done this to me for the last time. I got it. They'd done the same to me and Meg as well. But it wasn't them, technically. It was the most gung-ho member of Pa's comms team a true believer who devised and launched a new campaign of getting good press for Pei and Camilla at the expense of bad press for us. For some time this person had been peddling unflattering stories, fake stories, about the hair and spare, to all the papers. I suspected that this person had been the lone source for stories about a hunting trip I'd made to Germany in 2017. Stories that made me out to be some fat-bottomed 17th century baron who craved blood and trophies when in reality I was working with German farmers to cull wild boar and save their crops. I believe the story had been offered as a straight swap in exchange for greater access to Pa, and also as a reward for the suppression of stories about Camilla's son, who'd been gadding around London, generating tawdry rumours. I was displeased about being used like this and livid about it being done to Meg, but I had to admit it was happening much more often lately to Willie and he was justifiably incandescent. He'd already confronted Pei once about this woman, face to face. I'd gone along for moral support. The scene took place at Karen's house, in Pa's study. I remember the windows being wide open, the white curtains blowing in and out, so it must have been a warm night. Willie put it to Pa. How can you be letting a stranger do this to your sons? Pa instantly got upset. He began shouting that Willie was paranoid. We both were. Just because we were getting bad press and he was getting good, that didn't mean his staff was behind it. But we had proof. Reporters inside actual newsrooms assuring us that this woman was selling us out. Pei refused to listen. His response was churlish, pathetic. Granny has a person. Why can't I have mine? By Granny's person he meant Angela. Among the many services she performed for Granny, she was said to be skilled at planting stories. What a rubbish comparison, Willie said. Why would anyone in their right mind, let alone a grown man, want their own Angela? But Purgis kept saying it. Granny had her person. Granny had her person. High time he had a person too. I was glad that Willie felt he could still come to me about Pei and Camilla even after all we'd been through recently. Seeing an opportunity to address our recent tensions, 
I tried to connect what Pei and Camilla had done to him with what the press had done to Meg. Willie snapped. I've got different issues with you too. In a blink he shifted all his rage onto me. I can't recall his exact words, because I was beyond tired from all our fighting, to say nothing of the recent move into Frogmore, and into new offices, and I was focused on the imminent birth of our first child. But I recall every physical detail of the scene. The daffodils out, the new grass sprouting, a jet taking off from Heathrow, heading west, unusually low, its engines making my chest vibrate. I remember thinking how remarkable that I could still hear Willie above that jet. I couldn't imagine how he had that much anger left after the confrontation in Notcot. He was going on and on, and I lost the thread. I couldn't understand and I stopped trying. I fell silent, waiting for him to subside. Then I looked back. Meg was coming from the house, directly towards me. I quickly took the phone off speaker, but she'd already heard. And Willie was being so loud, even with the speaker off, she could still hear. The tears in her eyes glistened in the spring sunshine. I started to say something, but she stopped, shook her head. Holding her stomach, she turned and walked back to the house. Doria was staying with us, waiting for the baby to come. Neither she nor Meg ever strayed far. None of us did. We all just sat around waiting, going for the occasional walk, looking at the cows. When Meg was a week past her due date, the comms team and the palace began pressuring me. When's the baby coming? The press can't wait forever, you know. Oh, the press is getting frustrated. Heaven forbid. Meg's doctor had tried several homeopathic ways to get things moving, but our little visitor was just intent on staying put. I don't remember if we ever tried Granny's suggestion of a bumpy car ride. Finally we said, Let's just go and make sure nothing's wrong, and let's be prepared in case the doctor says it's time. We got into a nondescript people carrier and crept away from Frogmore without alerting any of the journalists stationed at the gates. It was the last sort of vehicle they suspected we'd be riding in. A short time later we arrived at the Portland Hospital and were spirited into a secret lift, then into a private room. Our doctor walked in, talked it through with us, and said it was time to induce. Meg was so calm. I was calm too. But I saw two ways of enhancing my calm. 1. Nando's Chicken Brought by our bodyguards. 2. A canister of laughing gas beside Meg's bed. I took several slow, penetrating hits. Meg, bouncing on a giant purple ball, a proven way of giving nature a push, laughed and rolled her eyes. I took several more hits and now I was bouncing too. When her contractions began to quicken and deepen, a nurse came and tried to give some laughing gas to Meg. There was none left. The nurse looked at the tank, looked at me, and I could see the thought slowly dawning. Gracious, the husbands had it all. Sorry, I said meekly. Meg laughed, the nurse had to laugh, and quickly changed the canister. Meg climbed into a bath, I turned on soothing music. Diva Primo, she remixed Sanskrit mantras into soulful hymns. Primo claimed she heard her first mantra in the womb, chanted by her father, and when he was dying she chanted the same mantra to him. Powerful stuff. In our overnight bag we had the same electric candles I'd arranged in the garden the night I proposed. Now I placed them around the hospital room. I also set a framed photo of my mother on a little table. Meg's idea. Time passed. Hour melted into hour. Minimal dilation. Meg was doing a lot of deep breathing for pain. Then the deep breathing stopped working. She was in so much pain that she needed an epidural. The anesthetist hurried in. Off went the music, on went the lights. Whoa! Vibe change. He gave her an injection at the base of her spine. Still the pain didn't let up. The medicine apparently wasn't getting where it needed to go. He came back, did it again. Now things both quietened and accelerated. A doctor came back two hours later, slipped both hands into a pair of rubber gloves. 
This is it. Everybody. I stationed myself at the head of the bed, holding Meg's hand, encouraging her. Push, my love. Breathe. The doctor gave Meg a small hand mirror. I tried not to look, but I had to. I glanced, saw a reflection of the baby's head emerging. Stuck. Tangled. Oh, no, please, no. The doctor looked up, a mouth set in a particular way. Things were getting serious. I said to Meg, My love, I need you to push. I didn't tell her why. I didn't tell her about the cord, didn't tell her about the likelihood of an emergency C-section. I just said, Give me everything you've got. And she did. I saw the little face, the tiny neck and chest and arms, wriggling, writhing. Life. Life. Amazing. I thought, wow, it really all begins with a struggle for freedom. A nurse swept the baby into a towel and placed him on Meg's chest and we both cried to see him, meet him. A healthy little boy, and he was here. Our Ayurvedic doctor had advised us that, in the first minute of life, a baby absorbs everything said to them. So whisper to the baby, tell the baby your wish for him, your love. Tell. We told. I didn't remember phoning anyone, texting them. I remember watching the nurses run tests on my hour-old son, and then we were out of there. Into the lift, into the underground car park, into the people carrier, and gone. Within two hours of our son being born, we were back at Frogmore. The sun had risen and we were behind closed doors before the official announcement was released. Say Meg had gone into labor. I had a tiff with Sarah about that. You know she's not in labor anymore, I said. She explained that the press must be given the dramatic, suspenseful story they demanded. But it's not true, I said. Ah, truth didn't matter. Keeping people tuned to the show. That was the thing. After a few hours I was standing outside the stables at Windsor, telling the world. It's a boy. Days later we announced the name to the world. Archie. The papers were incensed. They said we'd pulled a fast one on them. Indeed we had. They felt that, in doing so, we'd been bad partners. Astonishing. Did they still think of us as partners? Did they really expect special consideration, preferential treatment, given how they treated us these last three years? And then they showed the world what kind of partners they really were. A BBC radio presenter posted a photo on his social media. A man and a woman holding hands with a chimpanzee. The caption read, Royal Baby Leaves Hospital. I had a long tea with Granny just before she left for Bonroll. I gave her a recap, all the latest. She knew a bit, but I was filling in important gaps. She looked shocked. Appalling, she said. She vowed to send the bee to talk to us. I'd spent my life dealing with courtiers, scores of them, but now I dealt mostly with just three all middle-aged white men who'd managed to consolidate power through a series of bold Machiavellian maneuvers. They had normal names, exceedingly British names, but they sought more easily into zoological categories. The bee, the fly, and the wasp. The bee was oval-faced and fuzzy and tended to glide around with great equanimity and poise, as if he was a boon to all living things. He was so poised that people didn't fear him. Big mistake. Sometimes their last mistake. The fly had spent much of his career adjacent to, and indeed drawn to, shit. The offal of government and media, the wormy entrails, he loved it, grew fat on it, rubbed his hands in glee over it, though he pretended otherwise. He strove to give off an air of casualness, of being above the fray, coolly efficient and ever helpful. The wasp was lanky, charming, arrogant a ball of jazzy energy. He was great at pretending to be polite, even servile. You'd assert a fact, something seemingly incontrovertible. I believe the sun rises in the mornings. And he'd stammer that perchance you might consider for a moment the possibility that you'd be misinformed. Well, ha-ha, I don't know about that, your royal highness, 
You see, it all depends what you mean by mornings, sir. Because he seemed so weedy, so self-effacing, you might be tempted to push back, insist on your point, and that was when he'd put you on his list. A short time later, without warning, he'd give you such a stab with his outsized stinger that you'd cry out in confusion. Where the fuck did that come from? I disliked these men, and they didn't have any use for me. They considered me irrelevant at best, stupid at worst. Above all, they knew how I saw them, as usurpers. Deep down, I fear that each man felt himself to be the one true monarch, that each was taking advantage of a queen in her nineties, enjoying his influential position while merely appearing to serve. I'd come to this conclusion through cold hard experience. For instance, Meg and I had consulted with the Wasp about the press, and he'd agreed that the situation was abominable, that it needed to be stopped before someone got hurt. Yes, you'll get no argument from us on that. He suggested the palace convene a summit of all the major editors, make our case to them. Finally, I said to Meg, someone gets it. We never heard from him again. So I was skeptical when Granny offered to send us the bee, but I told myself to keep an open mind. Maybe this time would be different, because this time Granny was dispatching him personally. Days later, Meg and I welcomed the bee into Frogmore, made him comfortable in our new sitting room, offered him a glass of rosé, gave a detailed presentation. He took meticulous notes, frequently putting a hand over his mouth and shaking his head. He'd seen the headlines, he said, but he'd not appreciated the full impact this might have on a young couple. This deluge of hate and lies was unprecedented in British history, he said, disproportionate to anything I've ever seen. Thank you, we said. Thank you for seeing it. He promised to discuss the matter with all the necessary parties and get back to us soon with an action plan, a set of concrete solutions. We never heard from him again. Meg, and I were in the phone with Elton John and his husband, David, and we confessed. We need help. We're sort of losing it here, guys. Come to us, Elton said. By which he meant their home in France. Summer 2019. So we did. For a few days we sat on their terrace and soaked up their sunshine. We spent long healing moments gazing out at the Azure Sea, and it felt decadent, not just because of the luxurious setting. Freedom of any kind, in any measure, had come to feel like scandalous luxury. To be out of the fishbowl for even an afternoon felt like day release from prison. One afternoon we took a scooter ride with David, around the local bay, down the coastal road. I was driving, Meg was on the back, and she threw out her arms and shouted for joy as we zoomed through little towns, smelt people's dinners from open windows, waved to children playing in their gardens. They all waved back and smiled. They didn't know us. The best part of the visit was watching Elton and David and their two boys fall in love with Archie. Often I'd catch Elton studying Archie's face and I knew what he was thinking. Mummy, I knew because it happened so often to me as well. Time and again I'd see an expression cross Archie's face and it would bring me up short. I nearly said so to Elton, how much I wished my mother could hold her grandson. How often it happened that, while hugging Archie, I felt her, or wanted to. Every hug tinged with nostalgia, every tuck in touched with grief. Does anything bring you face to face with the past like parenthood? On the last night we were all experiencing that familiar end of holiday malaise. Why can't it be like this forever? We were drifting from the terrace to the pool, and back again, Elton offering cocktails, David and I chatting about the news, and the sorry state of the press, and what it meant for the state of Britain. We got on to books. David mentioned Elton's memoir, at which he'd been toiling for years. It was finally done, and Elton was mighty proud of it, and the publication date was drawing near. Bravo, Elton. Elton mentioned that it was going to be serialized. Is that so? Yes, Daily Mail. He saw my face. He quickly looked away. Elton, how in the absolute? 
I want people to read it. But, Elton, the very people who've made your life miserable. Exactly. Who better to accept it? Where better than the very newspaper that's been so poisonous to me my whole life? Who better? I just, I don't understand. It was a warm night, so I'd already been sweating. But now beads were dripping off my forehead. I reminded him of the specific lies the mail had famously printed about him. Hell, had sued them just over a decade earlier after they claimed he forbade people at a charity event from speaking to him. They'd ultimately written him a check for a hundred thousand pounds. I reminded him that he'd stirringly said in one interview, they can say I'm a fat old. They can say I'm an untalented bastard. They can call me a poof. But they mustn't lie about me. He didn't have an answer. But I didn't push it. I loved him. I'll always love him. And I also didn't want to spoil the holiday. It felt glorious to watch an entire country fall in love with my wife. South Africa, that is. September 2019. Another foreign tour, representing the Queen, and another triumph. From Cape Town to Johannesburg, people couldn't get enough of Meg. We both felt a bit more confident, therefore, a bit more courageous, just days before our return home, when we strapped on the battle armor and announced that we were suing three of the four British tabloids, including the one that printed Meg's letter to her father over their disgraceful conduct and over their long-standing practice of hacking into people's phones. It was partially down to Elton and David. At the end of our recent visit, they'd introduced us to a barrister, an acquaintance of theirs, a lovely fellow who knew more about the phone hacking scandal than anyone I'd ever met. He'd shared with me his expertise, plus loads of open court evidence. And when I told him I wished there was something I could do with it, when I complained that we'd been blocked at every turn by the palace, he offered a breathtakingly elegant workaround. Why not hire your own lawyer? I stammered. You mean, are you telling me we could just? What a thought. It had never occurred to me. I'd been so conditioned to do as I was told. I rang Granny to tell her beforehand. Part two. And I sent Willie a text. I also told the bee, giving him advance notice of the lawsuit, letting him know we had a statement ready to go, asking him to please redirect to our office all the press inquiries it would inevitably trigger. He wished us luck. It was amusing, therefore, when I heard that he and the wasp were claiming to have had no advance warning. In announcing the lawsuit, I laid out my case to the world. My wife has become one of the latest victims of a British tabloid press that wages campaigns against individuals with no thought to the consequences. A ruthless campaign that has escalated over the past year. Throughout her pregnancy, and while raising our newborn son, I cannot begin to describe how painful it has been. Though this action may not be the safe one, it is the right one. Because my deepest fear is history repeating itself. I lost my mother and now I watch my wife falling victim to the same powerful forces. The lawsuit wasn't covered as widely as, say, Meg's daring to shut her own car door. In fact, it was barely covered at all. Nonetheless, friends took note. Many texted, why now? Simple. In a few days the privacy laws in Britain were going to change in the tabloid's favour. We wanted our case to be heard before a crooked bat was introduced into the game. Friends also asked, why sue at all when you're riding so high in the press? The South Africa tour was a triumph. Coverage was wildly positive. That's the whole point, I explained. This isn't about wanting or needing good press. It's about not letting people get away with abuse. And lies. Especially the kind of lies that can destroy innocence. Maybe I sounded a bit self-righteous. Maybe I sounded as if I was on my high horse. But shortly after announcing our lawsuit, I felt energized by a ghastly story in the Express. How Meghan Markle's flowers may have put Princess Charlotte's life at risk. This latest scandal concerned the flower crowns worn by our bridesmaids more than a year earlier. Included in the crowns were a few lilies of the valley which can be poisonous to children. 
provided the children eat the lilies. Even then, the reaction would be discomfort, concerning to parents, but only in the rarest cases would such a thing be fatal. Never mind that an official florist put together these crowns. Never mind that it wasn't Meg who made this dangerous decision. Never mind that previous royal brides, including Kate and my mother, had also used lilies of the valley. Never mind all that. The story of Megan the murderess was just too good. An accompanying photo showed my poor little niece wearing her crown, face contorted in a paroxysm of agony or a sneeze. Alongside this photo was a shot of Meg looking sublimely unconcerned about the imminent death of this angelic child. I was summoned to Buckingham Palace, a lunch with Granny and Pa. The invitation was contained in a terse email from the bee, and the tone wasn't. Would you mind popping around? It was more. Get your ass over here. I threw on a suit, jumped into the car. The bee and the wasp were the first faces I saw when I walked into the room. An ambush. I thought this was to be a family lunch. Apparently not. Alone, without my staff, without Meg, I was confronted directly about my legal action. My father said it was massively damaging to the reputation of the family. How so? It makes our relationship with the media complicated. Complicated? There's a word. Anything you do affects the whole family. One could say the same about all your actions and decisions. They affect us as well. Like, for instance, whining and dining the same editors and journalists who've been attacking me and my wife. The bee or the wasp jumped in to remind me. One has to have a relationship with the press. Sir, we've talked about this before. A relationship, yes. But not a sordid affair. I tried a new tack. Everyone in this family has sued the press, including Granny. Why is this any different? Chirping crickets. Silence. There was some more wrangling, and then I said, We had no other option, and we wouldn't have had to do it if you'd all protected us, and protected the monarchy in the process. You're doing a disservice to yourselves by not protecting my wife. I looked around the table, stony faces. Was it incomprehension? Cognitive dissonance? A long-term mission at play? Or did they really not know? Were they so deep inside a bubble inside a bubble that they really hadn't fully appreciated how bad things were? For instance, Tatler magazine quoting an old Etonian saying I'd married Meg because foreigners, like her, are easier than girls with the right background. Or the Daily Mail saying Meg was upwardly mobile because she'd gone from slaves to royalty in just 150 years. Or the social media posts about her being a yacht girl and an escort, or calling her a gold digger, and a whore, and a bitch, and a slut, and the n-word, repeatedly. Some of those posts were in the comments section on the pages of all three palaces' social media accounts, and still hadn't been expunged. Or the tweet that said, Dear Duchess, I'm not saying that I hate you, but I hope your next period happens in a shark tank. Or the revelation of racist texts from Joe Mani, girlfriend of UKIP leader Henry Bolton, including one saying that my black American fiancé would taint the royal family, setting the stage for a black king, and another averring that Ms. Marnie would never have sex with a Negro. This is Britain, not Africa. All the male complaining that Meg couldn't keep her hands off her baby bump, that she was rubbing it and rubbing it as if she were a succubus. Things had got so out of hand, 72 women in Parliament from both main parties, had condemned the colonial undertones of all newspaper coverage of the Duchess of Sussex. None of these things had merited one comment, public or private, from my family. I knew how they rationalized it all, saying it was no different from what Camilla got. Or Kate. But it was different. One study looked closely at 400 vile tweets about Meg. Employing a team of data specialists and computer analysts, the study found that this avalanche of hate was wildly atypical, light years from anything directed at Camilla or Kate. A tweet calling Meg, the Queen of Monkey Island, had no historical precedent or equivalent. 
and this wasn't about hurt feelings or bruised egos. Hate had physical effects. There was a ton of science showing how unhealthy it is to be publicly hated and mocked. Meanwhile, the wider societal effects were even scarier. Certain kinds of people are more susceptible to such hate and incited by it. Hence the package of suspicious white powder that had been sent to our office with a disgusting racist note attached. I looked at Granny, looked around the room, reminded them that Meg and I had been coping with a wholly unique situation and doing it all by ourselves. Our dedicated staff was too small, too young, grossly underfunded. The bee and the wasp harumphed and said we should have let it be known that we were under-resourced. Let it be known. I said I'd begged them repeatedly. All of them. And one of our top aides had sent in pleas as well. Multiple times. Granny looked directly at the bee and the wasp. Is this true? The bee looked her right in the eye, and with the wasp nodding vigorously in assent, said, Your Majesty, we never received any of these requests for support. Meg, and I attended the Well Child Awards, an annual event that honored children suffering from serious illnesses. October 2019. I'd attended many times through the years, having been a royal patron of the organization since 2007, and it was always gutting. The children were so brave, their parents so proud, and tortured. Various awards were given that night for inspiration, fortitude, and I was presenting one to an especially resilient press cooler. I walked on stage, began my brief remarks, and caught sight of Meg's face. I thought back to a year ago, when she and I attended this event just weeks after taking that home pregnancy test. We'd been filled with hope and worry, like all expectant parents, and now we had a healthy little boy at home. But these parents and children hadn't been so lucky. Gratitude and sympathy converged in my heart, and I choked up. Unable to get the words out, I held the lectern tight and leaned forward. The presenter, who'd been a friend of my mother, stepped over and gave my shoulder a rub. It helped, as did the burst of applause, which gave me a moment to restart my vocal calls. Soon after, I got a text from Willie. He was in Pakistan on tour. He said I was clearly struggling and he was worried about me. I thanked him for his concern, assured him I was fine. I'd become emotional in front of a room full of sick kids and their folks just after becoming a father myself. Nothing abnormal in that. He said I wasn't well. He said again that I needed help. I reminded him that I was doing therapy. In fact, he'd recently told me he wanted to accompany me to a session because he suspected I was being brainwashed. Then come, I said. It will be good for you. Good for us. He never came. His strategy was patently obvious. I was unwell, which meant I was unwise. As if all my behavior needed to be called into question. I worked hard at keeping my texts to him civil. Nonetheless, the exchange turned into an argument which stretched over 72 hours. Back and forth we went, all day, late into the night. We'd never had a fight like that over text before. Angry, but also miles apart, as if we were speaking different languages. Now and then I realized that my worst fear was coming true. After months of therapy, after working hard to become more aware, more independent, I was a stranger to my older brother. He could no longer relate to me, tolerate me. Or maybe it was just the stress of the last few years the last few decades, finally pouring out. I saved the texts. I have them still. I read them sometimes, with sadness, with confusion, thinking. How did we ever get there? In his final texts, Willie wrote that he loved me, that he cared for me deeply, that he would do whatever is needed to help me. He told me to never feel any other way. Meg and I discussed getting away. But this time we weren't talking about a day at Wimbledon or a weekend with Elton. We were talking about escape. A friend knew someone who had a house we could borrow on Vancouver Island. Quiet, green, seemingly remote. Only reachable by ferry or plane, 
the friend said. November 2019 We arrived with Archie, Guy, Pula and our nanny, under cover of darkness, on a stormy night, and spent the next few days trying to unwind. It wasn't hard. From morning to night we didn't have to give a thought to being ambushed. The house was right on the edge of a sparkling green forest, with big gardens where Archie and the dogs could play, and it was nearly surrounded by the clean, cold sea. I could take a bracing swim in the morning. Best of all, no one knew we were there. We hiked, we caked, we played, in peace. After a few days we needed supplies. We ventured out timidly, drove down the road into the nearest village, walked along the pavement like people in a horror movie. Where would the attack come from? Which direction? But it didn't happen. People didn't freak. They didn't stare. They didn't reach for their iPhones. Everyone knew, or sensed, that we were going through something. They gave us space, while also managing to make us feel welcome, with a kind smile, a wave. They made us feel like part of a community. They made us feel normal. For six weeks. Then the Daily Mail printed our address. Within hours the boats arrived. An invasion by sea. Each boat bristled with telephoto lenses, arrayed like guns along the decks, and every lens was aimed at our windows. At our boy. So much for playing in the gardens. We grabbed Archie, pulled him into the house. They shot through the kitchen windows during his feeds. We pulled down the blinds. The next time we drove into town, there were forty paps along the route. Forty. We counted. Some gave chase. At our favorite little general store, a plaintive sign now hung in the window. No media. We hurried back to the house, pulled the blinds even tighter, returned to a kind of permanent twilight. Meg said she'd officially come full circle. Back in Canada, afraid to raise the blinds. But blinds weren't enough. Security cameras along the back fence of the property soon picked up a skeletal man pacing, peering, looking for a way in, and taking photos over the fence. He wore a filthy puffer vest, dirty trousers bunched around his raggedy shoes, and he looked as if nothing was beneath him. Nothing. His name was Steve Dennett. He was a freelance pap who'd spied on us before, in the employ of Splash. He was a pest, but maybe the next guy would be more than a pest. Can't stay here, we said. And yet? Brief as it was, that taste of freedom had got us thinking. What if life could be like that? All the time? What if we could spend at least part of each year somewhere far away, still doing work for the Queen, but beyond the reach of the press? Free. Free from the British press. Free from the drama. Free from the lies. But also free from the supposed public interest that was used to justify the frenzied coverage of us. The question was, where? We talked about New Zealand. We talked about South Africa. Half the year in Cape Town maybe. That could work. Away from the drama. But closer to my conservation work and to 18 other Commonwealth countries. I'd run the idea by Granny once before. She'd even signed off on it. And I'd run it by Pa, at Clarence House, the Wasp present. He told me to put it in writing, which I'd done immediately. Within a few days it was in all the papers and caused a huge stink. So now, at the end of December 2019, when I was chatting with Pa on the phone, saying we were more serious than ever about spending part of the year away from Britain. I wasn't having it when he said that I must write it down. Yeah, um, did that once before, Pa. And our plan immediately got leaked and scuppered. I can't help you if you don't put it in writing, darling boy. These things have to go through government. For the love of. So, in the first days of January 2020, I sent him a waitermarked letter broadly outlining the idea, with bullet points, and many details. Throughout the exchanges that followed, all marked private and confidential, I hammered the essential theme. We were prepared to make any sacrifice necessary to find some peace and safety, including relinquishing our Sussex titles. 
I rang to get his thoughts. He wouldn't come to the phone. I soon received a long email from him saying we'd have to sit down and discuss the whole thing in person. He'd like us to come back as soon as possible. You're in luck, Pa. We're coming back to Britain in the next few days. To see Granny. So, when can we meet? Not before the end of January. What? That's more than a month away. I'm in Scotland. I can't get there before then. I really hope and trust that we will be able to have further conversations without this getting into the public domain and it becoming a circus, I wrote. He responded with what felt like an ominous threat. You'll be disobeying orders from the monarch and myself if you persist in this course of action before we have a chance to sit down. I rang Granny on January 3. We're coming back to Britain, I said. We'd love to see you. I told her explicitly that we hoped to discuss with her our plan to create a different working arrangement. She wasn't pleased. Neither was she shocked. She knew how unhappy we were, she'd seen this day on the horizon. One good chat with my grandmother, I felt, would bring this ordeal to an end. I said, Granny, are you free? Yes, of course. I'm free all week. The diary is clear. That's great. Meg and I can come up for tea and then drive back to London. We have an engagement at Canada House the next day. You'll be exhausted from the travel. Do you want to stay here? By here, she meant Sandringham. Yes, that would be easier, and I told her so. That would be lovely. Thank you. Are you planning to see your father too? I asked, but he said it's impossible. He's in Scotland and can't leave until the end of the month. She made a little sound. A sigh or a knowing grunt. I had to laugh. She said, I have only one thing to say about that. Yes. Your father always does what he wants to do. Days later, January 5, as Meg and I boarded a flight in Vancouver, I put a frantic note from our staff, who'd received a frantic note from the bee. Granny wouldn't be able to see me. Initially, Her Majesty thought this would be possible. It will not. The Duke of Sussex cannot come to Norfolk tomorrow. Her Majesty will be able to arrange another muck this month. No announcements about anything shall be issued until such a meeting takes place. I said to Meg, they're blocking me from seeing my own grandmother. When we landed, I considered driving straight to Sandringham anyway. To hell with the bee. Who was he to try to block me? I imagined our car being stopped at the gate by palace police. I imagined smashing past security, the gate snapping across the bonnet. Diverting fantasy, and a fun way to spend the trip from the airport, uh, no? I'd have to bide my time. When we reached Frogmore, I rang Granny again. I imagined the phone ringing on her desk. I could actually hear it in my mind, Baran like the red phone in the VHR tent. Troops in contact. Then I heard her voice. Hello? Hi, Granny, it's Harry. Sorry, I must have misunderstood you the other day when you said you didn't have anything going on today. Something came up that I wasn't aware of. Her voice was strange. Can I pop in tomorrow then, Granny? Um. Well, I'm busy all week. At least, she added, that was what the bee told her. Is he in the room with you, Granny? No answer. We got word from Sarah that the sun was about to run a story saying the Duke and Duchess of Sussex were stepping away from their royal duties to spend more time in Canada. A sad little man, the newspaper's showbiz editor, was said to be the lead reporter on the story. Why him? Why, of all people, the showbiz guy? because lately he'd refashioned himself into some sort of quasi-royal correspondent, largely on the strength of this secret relationship with one particularly close friend of Willie's comm secretary, who fed him trivial, and mostly fake, gossip. He was sure to get everything wrong, as he got everything wrong on his last big, exclusive, tirogate. He was equally sure to cram his story into the paper as fast as possible, because he was likely working in concert with the palace, whose courtiers were determined to get ahead of us and spin the story. We didn't want that. 
We didn't want anyone else breaking our news, twisting our news. We'd have to rush out a statement. I phoned Granny again, told her about the sun, told her we might need to hurry up a statement. She understood. She'd allow it, so long as it didn't add to speculation. I didn't tell her exactly what our statement would say. She didn't ask. But also I didn't fully know yet. I gave her the gist, however, and mentioned some of the basic details I'd outlined in the memo Pa had demanded and which she'd seen. The wording needed to be precise. And it needed to be bland. Calm. We didn't want to assign any blame, didn't want to stoke the fires. Mustn't add to speculation. Formidable writing challenge. We soon realized it wasn't possible. We didn't have time to get our statement out there first. We opened a bottle of wine. Proceed, sad little man. Proceed. He did. The Sun posted his story late that night and again on the morning's front page. Headline. We are off. As expected, the story depicted our departure as a rollicking, carefree, hedonistic tapping out rather than a careful retreat and attempt at self-preservation. It also included the telling detail that we'd offered to relinquish our Sussex titles. There was only one document on earth in which that detail was mentioned, my private and confidential letter to my father, to which a shockingly, damningly small number of people had access. We hadn't mentioned it to even our closest friends. January 7, we worked some more on the draft, did a brief public appearance, met with our staff. Finally, knowing more details were about to be leaked, on January 8 we hunkered down deep inside Buckingham Palace, in one of the main staterooms, with the two most senior members of our staff. I'd always liked that stateroom, its pale walls, its sparkly crystal chandelier. But now it struck me as especially lovely and I thought, has it always been so? As it always looked so, royal, in a corner of the stateroom was a grand wooden desk. We used this as our workspace. We took turns sitting there, typing on a laptop. We tried out different phrases. We wanted to say that we were taking a reduced role, stepping back but not down. Hard to get the exact wording, the right tone. Serious, but respectful. Occasionally one of us would stretch out in a nearby armchair, or give the eyes a rest by gazing out of the two huge windows onto the gardens. When I needed a longer break I set off on a trek across the Oshamek carpet. On the far side of the room, in the left corner, a small door led to the Belgian suite, where Meg and I had once spent the night. In the near corner stood two tall wooden doors, the kind people think of when they hear the word palace. These led to a room in which I'd attended countless cocktail parties. I thought back on those gatherings, on all the good times I'd had in this place. I remembered. The room right next door was where the family always gathered for drinks before Christmas lunch. I went out into the hall. There was a tall, beautiful Christmas tree, still brightly lit. I stood before it, reminiscing. I removed two ornaments, soft little gorgeous, and brought them back to the staffers. One each. Souvenir of this strange mission, I said. They were touched, but a bit guilty. I assured them, no one will miss them. Words that seemed double-edged. Late in the day, as we crawled closer to a final draft, the staffers began to feel anxious. They worried aloud if their involvement would be discovered. If so, what would it mean for their jobs? But mostly they were excited. They felt that they were on the side of right. Both had read every word of abuse in the press and on social media, going back months and months. At 6 p.m. it was done. We gathered around the laptop, read the draft one last time. One staffer messaged the private secretaries of Granny, Pei, and Willie, told them what was coming. Willie's guy replied immediately, this is going to go nuclear. I knew, of course, that many Britons would be shocked and saddened, which made my stomach churn. But in due course, once they knew the truth, I felt confident they'd understand. One of the staffers said, Are we doing this? Meg! And I both said, Yes, there's no other choice. 
We sent the statement to our social media person. Within a minute there it was, live, on our Instagram page, the only platform available to us. We all hugged, wiped our eyes, and quickly gathered our things. Meg and I walked out of the palace and jumped into our car. As we sped towards Frogmore, the news was already on the radio. Every channel. We picked one. Magic FM. Meg's favorite. We listened to the presenter work himself into a very British lava. We held hands and shared a smile with our bodyguards in the front seat. Then we all gazed silently out of the windows. Days later, there was a meeting at Sandringham. I don't remember who called it the Sandringham Summit. Someone in the press, I suspect. On my way there I got a text from Marco about a story in the Times. Willie was declaring that he and I were now separate entities. I've put my arm around my brother all our lives and I can't do that anymore, he said. Meg had gone back to Canada to be with Archie, so I was on my own for this summit. I got there early, hoping to have a quick chat with Granny. She was sitting on a bench before the fireplace, and I sat down beside her. I saw the wasp react with alarm. He went buzzing off and moments later returned with Pear, who sat beside me. Immediately after him came Willie, who looked at me as if he planned to murder me. Hello, Harold. He sat across from me. Separate entities indeed. When all participants had arrived, we shifted to a long conference table, with Granny at the head. Before each chair was a royal notepad and pencil. The bee and the wasp conducted a quick summary of where we were. The subject of the press came up pretty quickly. I referenced their cruel and criminal behavior, but said they'd had a ton of help. This family had enabled the papers by looking the other way or by actively courting them, and some of the staff had worked directly with the press, briefing them, planting stories, occasionally rewarding and fating them. The press was a big part of why we'd come to this crisis. Their business model demanded that we be in constant conflict, but they weren't the only culprits. I looked at Willie. This was his moment to jump in, echo what I was saying, talk about his maddening experiences with Pear and Camilla. Instead he complained about a story in the morning papers suggesting that he was the reason we were leaving. I'm now being accused of bullying you and Meg out of the family. I wanted to say, we had nothing to do with that story, but imagine how you might feel if we had leaked it. Then you'll know how Meg and I have felt the last three years. The private secretaries began to address Granny about the five options. Your Majesty, you've seen the five options. Yes, she said. We all had. They'd been emailed to us, five different ways of proceeding. Option one was continuance of the status quo. Meg, and I don't believe, everyone tries to go back to normal. Option five was full severance, no royal role, no working for granny, and total loss of security. Option three was somewhere in between. A compromise, closest to what we'd originally proposed. I told everyone assembled that, above all, I was desperate to keep security. That was what worried me most, my family's physical safety. I wanted to prevent a repeat of history, another untimely death like the one that had rocked this family to its core 23 years earlier, and from which we were still trying to recover. I'd consulted with several palace veterans, people who knew the inner workings of the monarchy and its history, and they all said option three was best for all parties. Meg and I living elsewhere part of the year, continuing our work, retaining security, returning to Britain for charities, ceremonies, events. Sensible solution, these palace veterans said, and eminently doable. But the family, of course, pushed me to take option one. Barring that, they would only accept option five. We discussed the five options for nearly an hour. At last the bee got up and went around the table, handing out a draft of a statement the palace would soon be releasing, announcing implementation of option five. Wait, I'm confused. You've already drafted a statement? Before any discussion, announcing option five. In other words, the fix was in, 
this whole time. This summit was just for show. No answer. I asked if there were drafts of other statements. Announcing the other options. Oh yes, of course, the bee assured me. Can I see them? Alas, his printer had gone on the blink, he said. The odds. At the very moment he was about to print out those other drafts. I started laughing. Is this some kind of joke? Everyone was staring away or down at their shoes. I turned to Granny. Do you mind if I take a moment, get some air? Of course. I left the room. I walked into a big hall and ran into Lady Susan, who'd worked for Granny for years, and Mr. R., my former upstairs neighbor in the badger set. They could see I was upset and they asked if there was anything they could do for me. I smiled and said, No, thank you, then went back into the room. There was some discussion at this point of option three. Or was it option two? It was all starting to give me a headache. They were wearing me down. I didn't bloody care which option we adopted, so long as security remained in place. I pleaded for continuation of the same armed police protection I'd had, and needed, since birth. I'd never been allowed to go anywhere without three armed bodyguards, even when I was supposedly the most popular member of the family, and now I was the target, along with my wife and son of unprecedented hate, and the leading proposal under discussion called for total abandonment. Madness. I offered to defray the cost of security out of my own pocket. I wasn't sure how I'd do that, but I'd find a way. I made one last pitch. Look, please. Meg, and I don't care about perks, we care about working, serving, and staying alive. This seemed simple and persuasive. All the heads around the table went up and down. As the meeting came to a close there was a basic, general agreement. The many fine, granular details of this hybrid arrangement would be sorted out over a twelve-month transitional period, during which we'd continue to have security. Granny rose. We all rose. She walked out. For me there was one more piece of unfinished business. I went off to find the office of the bee. Luckily, I ran into the Queen's friendliest page, who'd always liked me. I asked for directions. He said he'd take me himself. He led me through the kitchen, up some back stairs, down a narrow corridor. Just that way, he said, pointing. A few steps later I came upon a huge printer, shoning out documents. The bee's assistant swung into view. Hello. I pointed at the printer and said, this seems to be working fine. Yes, your royal highness. Not broken. That thing? It's indestructible, sir. I asked about the printer in the bee's office. That one worked too? Oh, yes, sir. Did you need to print something out? No, thank you. I went farther down the corridor, through a door. Everything suddenly looked familiar. Then I remembered. This was the corridor where I'd slept that Christmas after returning from the South Pole. And now along came the bee. Head on. He saw me and looked extremely sheepish. For a bee. He could tell what I was up to. He heard the printer wearing away. He knew he was busted. Oh, sir, plead, sir. Don't worry about that. It's really not important. Isn't it? I walked away from him, went downstairs. Someone suggested that before I left I should step outside with Willie. Cool our heads. All right. We went up and down the yew hedges. The day was freezing. I was wearing only a light jacket, and Willie was in a jumper, so both of us were shivering. I was struck again by the beauty of it all. As in the stateroom, I felt as if I'd never seen a palace before. These gardens, I thought, they're paradise. Why can't we just enjoy them? I was braced for a lecture. It didn't come. Willie was subdued. He wanted to listen. For the first time in a long time my brother heard me out, and I was so grateful. I told him about one past staff member sabotaging Meg. Plotting against her. 
I told him about one current staff member, whose close friend was taking payments for leaking private stuff to the press about Meg and me. My sources on this were above reproach, including several journalists and barristers. Plus, I'd made a visit to New Scotland Yard. Willie frowned. He and Kate had their own suspicions. He'd look into it. We agreed to keep talking. I jumped into the car car and was immediately told that a strongly worded denial had been put out by the palace, squashing that morning's bullying story. The denial was signed by none other than me and Willie, my name attached by faceless others to words I'd never even seen, let alone approved. I was stunned. I went back to Frogmore. From there, remotely, over the next few days, I took part in the drafting of a final statement, which went out January 18, 2020. The palace announced that the Duke and Duchess of Sussex had agreed to step back, that we'd no longer formally represent the Queen, that our HRH titles would be in abeyance during this transitional year, and that we'd offered to reimburse the sovereign grant for refurbishments to Frogmore Cottage. Affirm no comment on the status of our security. I flew back to Vancouver. Delicious reunion with Meg, Archie and the dogs. And yet, for a few days, I didn't feel fully back. Part of me was still in Britain. Still at Sandringham. I spent hours glued to my phone and the internet, monitoring the fallout. The ire directed at us by the papers and the trolls was alarming. Make no mistake, it's an insult, cried the Daily Mail, which convened a Fleet Street jury to consider our crimes. Among them was the Queen's ex-press secretary, who concluded, with his fellow jurors, that we should hereafter expect no mercy. I shook my head. No mercy. The language of war. Clearly this was more than simple anger. These men and women saw me as an existential threat. If our leaving posed a threat to the monarchy, as some were saying, then it posed a threat to all those covering the monarchy for a living. Hence, we had to be destroyed. One of this lot, who'd written a book about me and thus providently depended on me to pay her rent, went on live TV to explain confidently that Meg, and I had departed from Britain without so much as a buy or leave to Granny. We discussed it with no one, she said, not even Pa. She announced these falsehoods with such unfaltering certainty that even I was tempted to believe her, and thus her version of events quickly became the truth in many circles. Harry blindsided the Queen. That was the narrative that took hold. I could feel it oozing into history books, and I could imagine boys and girls at Ludgrove, decades hence, having that hogwash rammed down their throats. I sat up late, brooding on it all, going over the progression of events and asking myself, what's the matter with these people? What makes them like this? Is it all just about the money? Isn't it always? All my life I've heard people saying the monarchy was expensive, anachronistic, and meg, and I were now served up as proof. Our wedding was cited as Exhibit A. It cost millions, and thereafter we'd up and left. Ingrates. But the family paid for the actual wedding, and a huge portion of the remaining cost was for security, much of which was made necessary by the press stirring up racism and class resentment. And the security experts themselves told us the snipers and sniffer dogs weren't just for us. They were to prevent a shooter from strafing the crowds on the long walk, or a suicide bomber blowing up the parade route. Maybe money sits at the heart of every controversy about monarchy. Britain has long had trouble making up its mind. Many support the crown, but many also feel anxious about the cost. That anxiety is increased by the fact that the cost is unknowable. Depends on who's crunching the numbers. Does the crown cost taxpayers? Yes. Does it also pay a fortune into government coffers? Also yes. Does the crown generate tourism income that benefits all? Of course. Does it also rest upon lands obtained and secured when the system was unjust and wealth was generated by exploited workers and thuggery, annexation and enslaved people? Can anyone deny it? According to the last study I saw, the monarchy costs the average taxpayer the price of a pint each year. 
in light of its many good works that seems a pretty sound investment. But no one wants to hear a prince argue for the existence of a monarchy, any more than they want to hear a prince argue against it. I leave cost-benefit analyses to others. My emotions are complicated on this subject, naturally, but my bottom-line position isn't. I'll forever support my queen, my commander-in-chief, my granny, even after she's gone. My problem has never been with the monarchy, nor the concept of monarchy. It's been with the press and the sick relationship that's evolved between it and the palace. I would love my mother country, and I love my family, and I always will. I just wish, at the second darkest moment of my life, they'd both been there for me. And I believe they'll look back one day and wish they had too. The question was where to live. We considered Canada. By and large it had been good to us. It had already come to feel like home. We could imagine spending the rest of our lives there. If we could just find a place the press didn't know about, we said, Canada might be the answer. Meg got in touch with a Vancouver friend who connected us with an estate agent and we started looking at houses. We were taking first steps, trying to be positive. Doesn't really matter where we live, we said, so long as the palace fulfills its obligation, and what I felt was its implicit promise, to keep us safe. Meg asked me one night, You don't think they'd ever pull our security, do you? Never, not in this climate of hate, and not after what happened to my mother. Also, not in the wake of my Uncle Andrew. He was embroiled in a shameful scandal, accused of the sexual assault of a young woman, and no one had so much as suggested that he lose his security. Whatever grievances people had against us, sex crimes weren't on the list. February 2020 I scooped Archie from his nap and took him out to the lawn. It was sunny cold, and we gazed at the water, touched the dry leaves collected rocks and twigs. I kissed his chubby little cheeks, tickled him, then glanced down at my phone to see a text from the head of our security team, Lloyd. He needed to see me. I carried Archie across the garden and handed him to Meg, then went across the soggy grass to the cottage where Lloyd and the other bodyguards were staying. We sat on a bench, both of us wearing puffer jackets. Waves rolling gently in the background. Lloyd told me that our security was being pulled. He and the whole team had been ordered to evacuate. Surely they can't. I would tend to agree, but they are. So much for the year of transition. The threat level for us, Lloyd said, was still higher than for that of nearly every other royal, equal to that assigned the Queen. And yet the word had come down and there was to be no arguing. So here we are, I said. The ultimate nightmare. The worst of all worst-case scenarios. Any bad actor in the world would now be able to find us, and it would just be me with a pistol to stop them. Oh wait, no pistol. I'm in Canada. I rang Pa. He wouldn't take my calls. Just then I got a text from Willie. Can you speak? Great. I was sure my older brother, after our recent walk in the Sandringham Gardens, would be sympathetic. That he'd step up. He said it was a government decision. Nothing to be done. Lloyd was pleading with his superiors at home, trying to get them at least to postpone the date when he and his team pulled out. He showed me the emails. He wrote, We can't just leave them here. The person at the other end wrote, The decision has been made. As of March 31 they're by themselves. I scrambled to find new security. I spoke to consultants, gathered estimates. I filled a notebook with research. The palace directed me to a firm, which quoted me a price. Six million a year. I slowly hung up. In the midst of all this darkness came the horrible news that my old friend Caroline Flack had taken her life. She couldn't stand it anymore, apparently. The relentless abuse at the hands of the press, year after year, had finally broken her. I felt so awful for her family. I remembered how they'd all suffered for her mortal sin of going out with me. She'd been so light and funny that night we met. The definition of carefree. 
it would have been impossible then to imagine this outcome. I told myself it was an important reminder. I wasn't being overdramatic. I wasn't warning about things that would never happen. What, Meg? And I were dealing with was indeed a question of life and death. And time was running out. In March 2020, the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic, and Canada began to discuss the possibility of closing its borders. But Meg had zero doubt. They're definitely going to close those borders, so we need to figure out somewhere else to go and get there. We were having a chat with Tyler Perry, the actor-writer-director. He'd sent a note to Meg before the wedding, out of the blue, telling her that she wasn't alone, that he saw what was happening. Now, facetiming with him, Meg and I were trying to put on a brave face, but we were both a mess. Tyler saw. He asked what was up. We gave him the highlights, the loss of security, the borders closing. Nowhere to turn. Whoa. Oh, that's a lot. But just breathe. Breathe. That was the problem. We couldn't breathe. Look, take my house. What? My house in Los Angeles. It's gated. It's secure. You'll be safe there. I'll keep you safe. He was traveling, he explained, working on a project. So the house was empty, waiting for us. It was too much. Too generous. But we accepted. Eagerly. I asked why he was doing this. My mother. Your? My mother loved your mother. I was caught completely by surprise. He said, After your mother visited Harlem, that was it. She could do no wrong in Maxine Perry's book. He went on to say that his mother had died ten years earlier, and he was still grieving. I wanted to tell him it gets easier. I didn't. The house was Ganadu. High ceilings, priceless art, beautiful swimming pool. Palatial, but above all, ultra-safe. Better yet, it came with security, paid for by Tyler. We spent those last days of March 2020 exploring, unpacking, trying to get our bearings. Halls, wardrobes, bedrooms, there seemed no end of spaces to discover and niches for Archie to hide. Meg introduced him to everything. Look at this statue. Look at this fountain. Look at these hummingbirds in the garden. In the front hall was a painting he found especially interesting. He started every day locked onto it. A scene from ancient Rome. We asked each other why. No clue. Within a week Tyler's house felt like home. Archie took his first steps in the garden a couple of months later at the height of the global pandemic lockdown. We clapped, hugged him, cheered. I thought, for a moment, how nice it would be to share the news with Grandpa or Uncle Willie. Not long after those first steps, Archie went marching up to his favorite painting in the front hall. He stared at it, made a gurgle of recognition. Meg leaned in for a closer look. She noticed, for the first time, a nameplate on the frame. Goddess of the Hunt. Diana. When we told Tyler, he said he hadn't known. He'd forgotten the painting was even there. He said, gives me chills. Us too. Late at night with everyone asleep, I'd walk the house, checking the doors and windows. Then I'd sit on the balcony or the edge of the garden and roll a joint. The house looked down onto a valley, across a hillside thick with frogs. I'd listen to their late night song, smell the flower-scented air. The frogs, the smells, the trees, the big starry sky, it all brought me back to Botswana. But maybe it's not just the flora and fauna, I thought. Maybe it's more the feeling of safety. Of life. We were able to get a lot of work done. And we had a lot of work to do. We launched a foundation. I reconnected with my contacts in world conservation. Things were getting under control. And then the press somehow learned we were at Tyler's. It had taken six weeks exactly, same as Canada. Suddenly there were drones overhead, paps across the street, paps across the valley. They cut the fence. 
We patched the fence. We stopped venturing outside. The garden was in full view of the paps. Next came the helicopters. Sadly, we were going to have to flee. We'd need to find somewhere new and soon, and that would mean paying for our own security. I went back to my notebooks, started contacting security firms again. Meg, and I sat down to work out exactly how much security we could afford, and how much house. Exactly then, while we were revising our budget, word came down. Pa was cutting me off. I recognized the absurdity. A man in his mid-thirties being financially cut off by his father. But Pa wasn't merely my father, he was my boss, my banker, my controller, keeper of the purse strings throughout my adult life. Cutting me off therefore meant firing me without redundancy pay and casting me into the void after a lifetime of service. More, after a lifetime of rendering me otherwise unemployable. I felt fatted for the slaughter. Suckled like a veal calf. I'd never asked to be financially dependent on Pa. I'd been forced into this surreal state, this unending Truman Show in which I almost never carried money, never owned a car, never carried a house key, never once ordered anything online, never received a single box from Amazon, almost never traveled on the underground. Once at Eton, on a theater trip, Sponge, the papers called me. But there's a big difference between being a sponge and being prohibited from learning independence. After decades of being rigorously and systematically infantilized, I was now abruptly abandoned and mocked for being immature, for not standing on my own two feet. The question of how to pay for a home and security kept Meg and me awake at nights. We could always spend some of my inheritance from mummy, we said, but that felt like a last resort. We saw that money as belonging to Archie and his sibling. It was then that we learned Meg was pregnant. We found a place, priced at a steep discount, just up the coast, outside Santa Barbara. Lots of room, large gardens, a climbing frame, even a pond with koi carp. The koi was stressed, the estate agent warned. So are we. We'll all get along famously. No, the agent explained, the koi need very particular care. You'll have to hire a koi guy. Bah ha! And where does one find a koi guy? The agent wasn't sure. We laughed. First world problems. We took a tour. The place was a dream. We asked Tyler to look at it too, and he said, Buy it. So we pulled together a down payment, took out a mortgage, and in July 2020 we moved in. The move itself required only a couple of hours. Everything we owned fitted into 13 suitcases. That first night we had a quiet drink in celebration, roasted a chicken, went to bed early. All was well, we said. And yet Meg was still under loads of stress. There was a pressing issue with her legal case against the tabloids. The mail was up to its usual tricks. Their first crack at offering a defense had been patently ridiculous, so now they were trying a new defense, which was even more ridiculous. They were arguing that they'd printed Meg's letter to her father because of a story in People magazine, which quoted a handful of Meg's friends, anonymously. The tabloids argued that Meg had orchestrated these quotes, used her friends as de facto spokespeople, and thus the male had every right to publish her letter to her father. More. They now wanted the names of Meg's previously anonymous friends read into the official court record, to destroy them. Meg was determined to do everything in her power to prevent that. She'd been staying up late, night after night, trying to work out how to save these people, and now, on our first morning in the new house, she reported abdominal pains and bleeding. Then she collapsed to the floor. We raced to the local hospital. When the doctor walked into the room, I didn't hear one word she said, I just watched her face, her body language. I already knew. We both did. There had been so much blood. Still, hearing the words was a blow. Meg grabbed me, I held her, we both wept. In my life I've felt totally helpless only four times. 
in the back of the car while Mummy and Willie and I were being chased by Paps. In the Apache above Afghanistan, unable to get clearance to do my duty. I'd not caught when my pregnant wife was planning to take her life. And now, we left the hospital with our unborn child. A tiny package. We went to a place, a secret place only we knew. Under a spreading banyan tree, while Meg wept, I dug a hole with my hands and set the tiny package softly in the ground. Five months later, Christmas 2020, we took Archie to find a Christmas tree, a pop-up lot in Santa Barbara. We bought one of the biggest spruces they had. We brought it home, set it up in the living room. Magnificent! We stood back, admiring, counting our blessings. New home. Healthy boy. Plus, we'd signed several corporate partnerships, which would give us the chance to resume our work, to spotlight the causes we cared about, to tell the stories we felt were vital, and to pay for our security. It was Christmas Eve. We FaceTimed with several friends, including a few in Britain. We watched Archie running around the tree, and we opened presents, keeping to the Windsor family tradition. One present was a little Christmas ornament of the Queen. I rolled. What the? Meg had spotted it in a local store and thought I might like it. I held it to the light. It was Granny's face to a T. I hung it on an eye-level branch. It made me happy to see her there. It made Meg and me smile. But then Archie, playing around the tree, jostled the stand, shook the tree, and Granny fell. I heard a smash and turned. Pieces lay all over the floor. Archie ran and grabbed a spray bottle. For some reason he thought spraying water on the broken pieces would fix it. Meg said, No, Archie, no, do not spray Gan Gan. I grabbed a dustpan and swept up the pieces, all the while thinking, This is weird. The palace announced that a review had been conducted of our roles and of the agreement reached in Sandringham. Henceforth, we were stripped of everything but a few patronages. February 2021 They took it all away, I thought, even my military associations. I'd no longer be Captain General of the Royal Marines, a title handed down by my grandfather. I'd no longer be permitted to wear my ceremonial military uniform. I told myself they could never take away my real uniform or my real military status. But still. Furthermore, the statement continued, we'd no longer be doing any service whatsoever for the Queen. They made it sound as if there'd been an agreement between us. There was nothing of the sort. We pushed back in our own statement, released the same day, saying we'd never cease living a life of service. This new slapdown from the palace was like petrol on a bonfire. We'd been under media attack non-stop since leaving, but this official severing of ties set off a new wave, which felt different. We were vilified every day, every hour, on social media, and found ourselves the subjects of scurrilous, wholly fictional stories in the newspapers, stories always attributed to royal aides or royal insiders or palace sources, Stories clearly spoon-fed by palace staff, and presumably sanctioned by my family. I didn't read any of it, seldom even heard about it. I was now avoiding the internet as I once avoided downtown Gansa. I kept my phone on silent. Not even vibrate. Sometimes a well-meaning friend would text. Gosh, sorry about such and such. We had to ask such friends, all friends, to stop informing us what they'd read. In all honesty, I hadn't been totally surprised when the palace cut ties. I'd had a sneak preview months earlier. Just before Remembrance Day, I'd asked the palace if someone could lay a wreath for me at the cenotaph, since, of course, I couldn't be there. Request denied. In that case, I said, could a wreath be laid somewhere else in Britain on my behalf? Request denied. In that case, I said, perhaps a wreath could be laid somewhere in the Commonwealth, anywhere at all, on my behalf. Request denied. 
Nowhere in the world would any proxy be permitted to lay any sort of wreath at any military grave on behalf of Prince Harry, I was told. I pleaded that this would be the first time I'd let a Remembrance Day pass without paying tribute to the fallen, some of whom had been dear friends. Request denied. In the end, I rang one of my old instructors at Sandhurst and asked him to lay my wreath for me. He suggested the Iraq and Afghanistan Memorial in London, which had just been unveiled a few years earlier. By Granny? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. He said it would be his honour. Then added, And by the by, Captain Wales. Fuck this. It's proper wrong. I wasn't sure what to call her or what exactly she did. All I knew was that she claimed to have powers. I recognised the high percentage chance of humbuggery. But the woman came with strong recommendations from trusted friends, so I asked myself, what's the harm? Then, the minute we sat down together, I felt an energy around her. Oh, I thought. Wow, there's something here. She felt an energy around me too, she said. Your mother is with you. I know. I've felt that of late. She said, No, she's with you. Right now. I felt my neck grow warm. My eyes watered. Your mother knows you're looking for clarity. Your mother feels your confusion. She knows that you have so many questions. I do. The answers will come in time. One day in the future. Have patience. Patience? The word caught in my throat. In the meantime, the woman said, My mother was very proud of me. And fully supportive. She knew it wasn't easy. What wasn't? Your mother says, You're living the life she couldn't. You're living the life she wanted for you. I swallowed. I wanted to believe. I wanted every word this woman was saying to be true. But I needed proof. A sign. Anything. Your mother says, The ornament? Ornament? She was there? Where? Your mother says, Something about a Christmas ornament? Of a mother? Or a grandmother? It fell? Broke? Archie tried to fix it. Your mother says she had a bit of a giggle about that. Frogmore Garden hours after Grandpa's funeral. I'd been walking with Willie and Pa for about half an hour, but it felt like one of those days-long marches the army put me through when I was a new soldier. I was beat. We'd reached an impasse, and we'd reached the Gothic ruin. After a circuitous route we'd arrived back where we'd begun. Pa and Willie were still claiming not to know why I'd fled Britain, still claiming not to know anything, and I was getting ready to walk away. Then one of them brought up the press. They asked about my hacking lawsuit. They still hadn't asked about Meg, but they were keen to know how my lawsuit was going, because that directly affected them. Still ongoing. Suicide mission, Pa mumbled. Maybe, but it's worth it. I'd soon prove that the press were more than liars, I said. That they were lawbreakers. I was going to see some of them thrown into jail. That was why they were attacking me so viciously. They knew I had hard evidence. It wasn't about me. It was a matter of public interest. Shaking his head, Pa allowed that journalists were the scum of the earth. His phrase, but. I snorted. There was always a but with him when it came to the press, because he hated their hate. But oh how he loved their love. One could make the argument that therein lay the seeds of the whole problem. Indeed, all problems, going back decades. Deprived of love as a boy, bullied by schoolmates, he was dangerously, compulsively drawn to the elixir they offered him. He cited Grandpa as a sterling example of why the press wasn't anything to get too vexed about. Poor Grandpa had been abused by the papers for most of his life, but now look. He was a national treasure. The papers couldn't say enough good things about the man. So that's it then. Just wait till we're dead and all will be sorted. If you could just endure it, darling boy, for a little while, in a funny way they'd respect you for it. I laughed. All I'm saying is, don't take it personally. 
Speaking of taking things personally, I told them I might learn to endure the press and even forgive their abuse. I might, but my own family's complicity. That was going to take longer to get over. Pa's office, Willie's office, enabling these fiends, if not outright collaborating. Meg was apparently a bully. That was the latest vicious campaign they'd helped orchestrate. It was so shocking, so egregious, that even after Meg, and I demolished their lie with a 25-page, evidence-filled report to human resources, I was going to have trouble simply shrugging that one off. Pa stepped back. Willie shook his head. They began talking over each other. We've been down this road a hundred times, they said. You're delusional, Harry. But they were the delusional ones. Even if, for the sake of argument, I accepted that Pa and Willie and their staff had never done one overt thing against me or my wife. Their silence was an undeniable fact. And that silence was damning. And continuing. And heart-rending. Pearl said, You must understand, darling boy, the institution can't just tell the media what to do. Again, I yelped with laughter. It was like Pear saying he couldn't just tell his valet what to do. Willie said I was a fine one to talk about cooperating with the press. What about my chat with Oprah? A month earlier, Meg, and I had done an interview with Oprah Winfrey. Days before it aired, those Meg is a bully stories started popping up in the papers. What a coincidence. Since leaving Britain, the attacks on us had been increasing exponentially. We had to try something to make it stop. Being silent wasn't working. It was only making it worse. We felt we had no choice. Several close mates and beloved figures in my life, including one of Hugh and Emily's sons, Emily herself, and even Tiggy, had chastised me for Oprah. How could you reveal such things? About your family? I told them that I failed to see how speaking to Oprah was any different from what my family and their staffs had done for decades. Briefing the press on the sleigh, planting stories. And what about the endless books on which they'd cooperated? Starting with Pa's 1994 crypto autobiography with Jonathan Dimbley. Or Camilla's collaborations with the editor Geordie Gregg? The only difference was that Meg and I were upfront about it. We chose an interviewer who was above reproach, and we didn't once hide behind phrases like palace sources. We let people see the words coming out of our mouths. I looked at the Gothic ruin. What's the point? I thought. Pa and Willie weren't hearing me, and I wasn't hearing them. They'd never had a satisfactory explanation for their actions and inactions, and never would, because there was no explanation. I started to say goodbye, good luck, take care, but Willie was really steaming, shouting that if things were as bad as I made out, then it was my fault for never asking for help. You never came to us. You never came to me. Since boyhood that had been Willie's position on everything. I must come to him. Pointedly, directly, formally, bend the knee. Otherwise, no aid from the hair. I wondered why I should have to ask my brother to help when my wife and I were in peril. If we were being mauled by a bear, and he saw, would he wait for us to ask for help? I mentioned the Sandringham Agreement. I'd asked for his help about that, when the agreement was violated, shredded, when we were stripped of everything, and he hadn't lifted a finger. That was Granny. Take it up with Granny. I waved a hand, disgusted, but he lunged, grabbed my shirt. Listen to me, Harold. I pulled away, refused to meet his gaze. He forced me to look into his eyes. Listen to me, Harold, listen. I love you, Harold. I want you to be happy. The words flew out of my mouth. I love you too. But your stubbornness is extraordinary. And yours isn't. I pulled away again. He grabbed me again, twisting me to maintain eye contact. Harold, you must listen to me. I just want you to be happy, Harold. I swear. I swear on Mummy's life. He stopped. I stopped. Pay stopped. He'd gone there. He'd used the secret code, the universal password. 
Ever since we were boys, those three words were to be used only in times of extreme crisis. On mummy's life. For nearly twenty-five years, we'd reserved that soul-crushing vow for times when one of us needed to be heard, to be believed, quickly. For times when nothing else would do. It stopped me cold, as it was meant to. Not because he used it, but because it didn't work. I simply didn't believe him, didn't fully trust him. And vice versa. He saw it too. He saw that we were in a place of such hurt and doubt that even those sacred words couldn't set us free. How lost we are, I thought. How far we've strayed. How much damage has been done to our love, our bond, and why? All because a dreadful mob of dweebs and crones and cut-rate criminals and clinically diagnosable sadists along Fleet Street feel the need to get their jollies and plump their profits, and work out their personal issues by tormenting one very large, very ancient, very dysfunctional family. Willie wasn't quite ready to accept defeat. I felt properly sick and ill after everything that's happened and, and, I swear to you now on mummy's life that I just want you to be happy. My voice broke as I told him softly, I really don't think you do. My mind suddenly flooded with memories of our relationship, but one in particular was crystalline. Willie and I, years before in Spain. A beautiful valley, the air glittery with that uncommonly clear Mediterranean light, the two of us kneeling behind a green canvas wall as the first hunting horn sounded. Lowering our flat caps as the first partridges burst towards us. Bang bang, a few falling, handing our guns to the loaders, who handed us new ones. Bang bang, more falling, passing our guns back, our shirts darkening with sweat the ground filling with birds that would feed nearby villages for weeks. Bang! One last shot. Neither of us able to miss. Then standing at last, drenched, starved, happy. Because we were young and together, and this was our place, our one true space, away from them and close to nature. It was such a transcendent moment that we turned and did that rarest of things. We hugged. Really hugged. But now I saw that even our finest moments, and my best memories, somehow involved death. Our lives were built on death, our brightest days shattered by it. Looking back, I didn't see spots of time, but dances with death. I saw how we steeped ourselves in it. We christened and crowned, graduated and married, passed out and passed over our beloved's bones. Windsor Castle itself was a tomb, the walls filled with ancestors. The Tower of London was held together with the blood of animals, used by the original builders a thousand years ago to temper the mortar between the bricks. Outsiders called us a cult, but maybe we were a deaf cult, and wasn't that a little bit more depraved? Even after laying Grandpa to rest, had we not had our fill? Why were we here, lurking along the edge of that undiscovered country, from whose born no traveller returns? Though maybe that's a more apt description of America. Willie was still talking, Pei was talking over him, and I could no longer hear a word they said. I was already gone, already on my way to California, a voice in my head saying, Enough death, enough. When is someone in this family going to break free and live? It was slightly easier this time, maybe because we were an ocean away from the old chaos and stress. When the big day came we were both surer, calmer, steadier. What bliss, we said, not having to worry about timing, protocols, journalists at the front gate. We drove calmly, sanely to the hospital, where our bodyguards once again fed us. This time they brought burgers and fries from in and out, and fire tuts from a local Mexican restaurant for Meg. We ate and ate, and then did the baby mama dance around the hospital room. Nothing but joy and love in that room. Still, after many hours, Meg asked the doctor, When? Soon. We're close. This time I didn't touch the laughing gas. Because there was none. I was fully present. I was with Meg through every push. When the doctor said it was a matter of minutes, I told Meg that I wanted mine to be the first face our little girl saw. We knew we were having a daughter. Meg nodded, squeezed my hand. 
I went and stood beside the doctor. We both crouched, as if about to pray. The doctor called out, The head is croning. Croning, I thought. Incredible. The skin was blue. I worried the baby wasn't getting enough air. Is she choking? I looked at Meg. One more push, my love. We're so close. Here, 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 the doctor said, guiding my hands. Right here. A scream, then a moment of pure liquid silence. It wasn't, as sometimes happens, that past and future were suddenly one. It was that the past didn't matter and the future didn't exist. There was only this intense present, and then the doctor turned to me and shouted, Now! I slid my hands under the tiny back and neck. Gently, but firmly, as I'd seen in films, I pulled our precious daughter from that world into this, and cradled her just a moment, trying to smile at her, to see her, but honestly, I couldn't see anything. I wanted to say, Hello. I wanted to say, Where have you come from? I wanted to say, Is it better there? Is it peaceful? Are you frightened? Don't be, don't be, all will be well. I'll keep you safe. I surrendered her to Meg. Skin to skin, the nurse said. Later, after we'd brought her home, after we'd settled into all the new rhythms of a family of four, Meg, and I was skin to skin, as she said. I've never been more in love with you than in that moment. Really? Really. She jotted some thoughts in a kind of journal, which she shared. I read them as a love poem. I read them as a testament, a renewal of our vows. I read them as a citation, a remembrance, a proclamation. I read them as a decree. She said, that was everything. She said, that is a man. My love, she said, that is not a spare. I helped Meg into the boat. It wobbled, but I quick stepped to the middle, got it righted in time. As she found a seat in the stern, I took up the oars. They didn't work. We're stuck. The thick mud of the shallows had us in its grip. Uncle Charles came down to the water's edge, gave us a little shove. We waved to him and to my two wants. Bye. See you in a bit. Gliding across the pond, I gazed around at Althorpe's rolling fields and ancient trees, the thousands of green acres where my mother grew up, and where, though things weren't perfect, she'd known some peace. Minutes later we reached the island and gingerly stepped onto the shore. I led Meg up the path, around a hedge, through the labyrinth. There it was, looming, the greyish-white oval stone. No visit to this place was ever easy, but this one. Twenty-fifth anniversary. And Meg's first time. At long last I was bringing the girl of my dreams home to meet Mum. We hesitated, hugging, and then I went first. I placed flowers on the grave. Meg gave me a moment, and I spoke to my mother in my head, told her I missed her, asked her for guidance and clarity. Feeling that Meg might also want a moment, I went around the hedge, scanned the pond. When I came back, Meg was kneeling, eyes shut, palms against the stone. I asked, as we walked back to the boat, what she prayed for. Carity, she said, and guidance. The next few days were given over to a whirlwind work trip. Manchester, Dusseldorf, then back to London for the World Child Awards. But that day, September 8, 2022, a call came in around lunchtime. Unknown number. Hello? It was Pa. Granny's health had taken a turn. She was up at Balmoral, of course. Those beautiful, melancholy late summer days. He hung up. He had many other calls to make. And I immediately texted Willie to ask whether he and Kate were flying up. If so, when? And how? No response. Meg, and I looked at flight options. The press started phoning. We couldn't delay a decision any longer. We told our team to confirm. We'd be missing the Well Child Awards and hurrying up to Scotland. Then came another call from Pa. 
He said I was welcome at Balmoral, but he didn't want. Ah. He started to lay out his reason, which was nonsensical and disrespectful, and I wasn't having it. Don't ever speak about my wife that way. He stammered, apologetic, saying he simply didn't want a lot of people around. No other wives were coming. Kate wasn't coming, he said. Therefore Meg shouldn't. Then that's all you needed to say. By now it was mid-afternoon. No more commercial flights that day to Aberdeen. And I still had no response from Willie. My only option, therefore, was a charter out of Luton. I was on board two hours later. I spent much of the flight staring at the clouds, replaying the last time I'd spoken with Granny. Four days earlier, long chat on the phone. We touched on many topics. Her health, of course. The turmoil at number 10. The Braemar games. She was sorry about not being well enough to attend. We talked also about the biblical drought. The lawn at Frogmore, where Meg and I were staying, was in terrible shape. Looks like the top of my head, Granny. Balding and brown in patches. She laughed. I told her to take care. I looked forward to seeing her soon. As the plane began its descent, my phone lit up. A text from Meg. Call me the moment you get this. I checked the BBC website. Granny was gone. Pa was king. I put on my black tie, walked off the plane into a thick mist, sped in a borrowed car to Bonnell. As I pulled through the front gates it was wetter and pitch dark, which made the white flashes from the dozens of cameras that much more blinding. Hunched against the cold, I hurried into the foyer. Aunt Anne was there to greet me. I hugged her. Where's Pa and Willie? And Camilla? Gone to Burkle, she said. She asked if I wanted to see Granny. Yes, I do. She led me upstairs, to Granny's bedroom. I braced myself, went in. The room was dimly lit, unfamiliar. I'd been inside it only once in my life. I moved her head uncertainly, and there she was. I stood, frozen, staring. I stared and stared. It was difficult, but I kept on, thinking how I'd regretted not seeing my mother at the end. Years of lamenting that lack of proof, postponing my grief for want of proof. Now I thought. Proof. Careful what you wish for. I whispered to her that I hoped she was happy, that I hoped she was with Grandpa. I said that I was in awe of her carrying out her duties to the last. The Jubilee, the welcoming of a new Prime Minister. On her 90th birthday my father had given a touching tribute, quoting Shakespeare on Elizabeth I. No day without a deed to crone it, ever true. I left the room, went back along the corridor, across the tartan carpet, past the statue of Queen Victoria. Your Majesty. I rang Meg, told her I'd made it, that I was okay, then walked into the sitting room and ate dinner with most of my family, though still no Pa, Willie, or Camilla. Towards the end of the meal, I braced myself for the bagpipes. But out of respect for Granny there was nothing. An eerie silence. The hour getting late, everyone drifted off to their rooms, except me. I went on a wander, up and down the stairs, the halls, ending up at the nursery. The old-fashioned basins, the tub, everything the same as it had been twenty-five years ago. I passed most of the night time traveling in my thoughts while trying to make actual travel arrangements on my phone. The quickest way back would have been a lift with Pei or Willie. Barring that, it was British Airways, departing Balmoral at daybreak. I bought a seat and was among the first to board. Soon after settling into a front row, I sensed a presence on my right. Deepest sympathies, said a fellow passenger before heading down the aisle. Thank you. Moments later, another presence. Condolences, Harry. Thanks, very much. Most passengers stopped to offer a kind word, and I felt a deep kinship with them all. Our country, I thought. Our queen. Meg greeted me at the front door of Frogmore with a long embrace, which I desperately needed. We sat down with a glass of water and a calendar. 
Our quick trip would now be an odyssey. Another ten days at least. Difficult days at that. More, we'd have to be away from the children for longer than we'd planned, longer than we'd ever been. When the funeral finally took place, Willie and I, barely exchanging a word, took our familiar places, set off on our familiar journey, behind yet another coffin draped in the royal standard, sitting atop another horse-pulled gun carriage. Same route, same sights, though this time. Unlike at previous funerals, we were shoulder to shoulder. Also, music was playing. When we got to St. George's Chapel, amid the roll of dozens of bagpipes, I thought of all the big occasions I'd experienced under that roof. Grandpa's farewell, my wedding, even the ordinary times, simple Easter Sundays, felt especially poignant, the whole family alive and together. Suddenly I was wiping my eyes. Why now? I wondered. Why? The following afternoon Meg and I left for America. For days and days we couldn't stop hugging the children, couldn't let them out of our sight, though I also couldn't stop picturing them with Granny. The final visit. Archie making deep, chivalrous bows, his baby sister Lilibet cuddling the monarch's shins. Sweetest children, Granny said, sounding bemused. She'd expected them to be a bit more. American, I think. Meaning, in her mind, more rambunctious. Now, while overjoyed to be home again, doing drop-offs again, reading giraffes can't dance again, I couldn't stop, remembering. Day and night, images flitted through my mind. Standing before her during my passing out parade, shoulders thrown back, catching her half smile. Stationed beside her on the balcony, saying something that caught her off guard and made her, despite the solemnity of the occasion, laugh out loud. Leaning into her ear, so many times, smelling her perfume as I whispered a joke. Kissing both cheeks at one public event, just recently, placing a hand lightly on her shoulder, feeling how frail she was becoming, making a silly video for the first Invictus Games, discovering that she was a natural comedian. People around the world howled and said they'd never suspected she possessed such a wicked sense of humor. But she did. She always did. That was one of our little secrets. In fact, in every photo of us, whenever we're exchanging a glance, making solid eye contact, it's clear. We had secrets. Special relationship, that's what they said about us. And now I couldn't stop thinking about the specialness that would no longer be. The visits that wouldn't take place. Ah well, I told myself, that's just the deal, isn't it? That's life. Still, as with so many partings, I just wished there'd been. One more goodbye. Soon after our return, a hummingbird got into the house. I had a devil of a time guiding it out, and the thought occurred that maybe we should start shutting the doors, despite those heavenly ocean breezes. Then a mate said, Could be a sign, you know. Some cultures see hummingbirds as spirits, he said. Visitors, as it were. Aztecs thought them reincarnated warriors. Spanish explorers called them resurrection birds. You don't say. I did some reading and learned that not only are hummingbirds visitors, they're voyagers. The lightest birds on the planet, and the fastest, they travel vast distances. From Mexican winter homes to Alaskan nesting grounds. Whenever you see a hummingbird, what you're actually seeing is a tiny, glittering odysseus. So, naturally, when this hummingbird arrived and swooped around our kitchen and flitted through the sacred airspace we call Lily Land, where we've set the baby's playpen with all her toys and stuffed animals. I thought hopefully, greedily, foolishly. Is our house a detour or a destination? For half a second I was tempted to let the hummingbird be. Let it stay. But no. Gently I used Archie's fishing net to scoop it from the ceiling, carry it outside. Its legs felt like eyelashes, its wings like flower petals. With cupped palms, I set the hummingbird gently on a wall in the sun. Goodbye, my friend. But it just lay there. Motionless. No, I thought. No, not that. Come on, 
Come on. You're free. Fly away. And then, against all odds and all expectations, that wonderful, magical little creature bestirred itself and did just that. For Meg and Archie and Lily. And of course my mother. A balanced diet is a taco in each hand. He who does not cheat does not progress. Better to prevent than to lament. Getting up early does not make the day come sooner. God helps those who wake up early. Even shoes don't fit with force. In bad times, put on a good face. Surround yourself with tacos, not negativity. I'm Mexican. What's your superpower? You don't need magic to appear. All you need is a destination. When the river makes noise, it carries water. He who left for Seville lost his chair. He who grasps too much, squeezes too little. To foolish words, deaf ears. There is a long way from saying to doing. There is no evil that does not come for good. To give speed to a bad step. In a turbulent river, fishermen's gain. There is no worse blind person than the one who does not want to see. You can't have everything in life. Eyes that do not see, heart that does not feel. He who talks a lot, hits little. He who sows winds, harvests storms. Wherever you go, do what you see. In the absence of bread, tortillas. Don't look at the teeth of a gift horse. Each crazy person has their own theme. He who gets angry, loses. He who is born to make tamales, the leaves fall from heaven for him. He who walks with wolves, learns to howl. He who does not cry, does not suckle. He who doesn't listen to advice, doesn't reach old age. Every pig has its St. Martin's Day. A parrot is green wherever it goes. It's not the same to call the devil than to see him coming. Full stomach, happy heart. With money even the dog dances. From that log, that splinter. A bird in the hand is worth more than one hundred flying. 
After the child drowns, they close the well. We are all mule drivers in the fields. You don't have yet wings and already want to fly. The one that embraces a lot can't keep it together. When one is hungry, there is no bad bread. A thief that steals from a thief has 100 years of forgiveness. War-worn does not kill any soldier. Misfortunes never come alone. Let foolish words fall on deaf ears. Sometimes the remedy is worse than the disease. Having a piano doesn't make you a pianist. Do good and don't look at whom. What may be done at any time will be done at no time. A fool may earn money, but it takes a wise man to keep it. A day to come seems longer than a year that's gone. A proud mind and an empty purse grow ill together. Better be ill-spoken of by one before all than by all before one. Get what you can and keep what you have. That's the way to get rich. Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds you plant. Marriages are all happy. It's having breakfast together that causes most of the trouble. He who left for Seville lost his chair. He who grasps too much, squeezes too little. To foolish words, deaf ears. There is a long way from saying to doing. There is no evil that does not come for good. To give speed to a bad step. In a turbulent river, fishermen's gain. There is no worse blind person than the one who does not want to see. It is the same life whether we spend it crying or laughing. One who smiles rather than rages is always the stronger. The smallest good deed is better than the grandest intention. The presence of fools makes wise people stand out. Even a fool has at least one talent. Everyone has their own tastes. Respect others. The reputation of a thousand years may be determined by the conduct of one hour. You can't do anything without risking something. The bamboo that bends is stronger than the oak that resists. Don't offer things to people who are incapable of appreciating them. Boasting begins where wisdom stops. The tongue is but three inches long, yet it can kill a man six feet high. 
People judge things by their own experience, not knowing of the wide world outside. Wherever you live, you come to love it. The day you decide to do it is your lucky day. 10 people, 10 colors. Experience nature and in doing so learn about yourself. To overcome a desperate situation, make a complete turn in one sudden burst. It's easier to give birth than to think about it. Beginning is easy, continuing is hard. There's no accounting for taste, to each his own. Half an hour in a spring evening is worth a thousand gold pieces. The more stupid the child, the dearer it is. Fear is only as deep as the mind allows. Everyone makes mistakes. Nobody's perfect. A frog in a well does not know the great ocean. Who chases two rabbits catches neither. To continue and preserve his power. There are hardships and there are delights. The smart hawk hides its talons. Luck exists in the leftovers. Even sea bream is not delicious when eaten in loneliness. Spilt water will not return to the tray. A samurai, even when he has not eaten, uses his toothpick. A kite breeding hawk. An apprentice near a temple will recite the scriptures untaught. Clear sky. Cultivate, rainy, read. Country is in ruins, and there are still mountains and rivers. Entering the village, obey the village. The mouth is the source of disaster. Child of a frog is a frog. If you do not enter the tiger's cave, you will not catch its cub. Fall down seven times, get up eight times. Even monkeys fall from trees. Self-work, self-profit. Not knowing is Buddha. The nail that sticks out is struck. Substance over style. Reality is never as good as your imagination. When it rains, earth hardens. Only a fool deals with a fool. Bad causes, bad result. Vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. There are no shortcuts to any place worth going. The weak are meat. One stroke, two halves. 
An idiot can't be cured of idiocy unless they die. Dead men tell no tales. A bad wife spells a hundred years of bad harvest. If you make a mistake, don't hesitate to correct it. Don't let your daughter-in-law eat your autumn eggplants. People want to avoid the dew before they become wet. Poke a bush, a snake comes out. The first glass a man drinks wine, with the second glass the wine drinks the wine, with the third glass the wine drinks the man. The soul of a three-year-old until a hundred. Evil cause, evil effect. Ocean thousand, mountain thousand. Drunken life, dreamy death. Meeting person always separated. There are even bugs that eat not wheat. Always bear in mind that your own resolution to succeed is more important than any other. The greatest danger for most of us is not that our aim is too high and we miss it, but that is it too low and we reach it. Whatever the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. Happiness is not something ready-made. It comes from your own actions. Be humble. Even an expert can make mistakes. Cold tea and cold rice are bearable, but not cold looks and cold words. Experience the beauties of nature, and in doing so learn about yourself. We learn little from victory, much from defeat. One kind word can warm three winter months. Even when months and days are long, life is short. Learn from yesterday, live for today, hope for tomorrow. Take a bad or desperate situation and turn it into a successful one.